The fifth round of the 2014 Blancpain Sprint Series sees the teams and drivers head to the Algarve in Portugal. The undulating circuit is a real challenge for the drivers and it usually provides some exciting racing. But first of all, let's look back to the last round in Slovakia. Polman Cesar Ramos got a poor getaway in his Audi and that led to a chain reaction at the first corner with a number of cars eliminated. One of them, the championship challengers, Harry Project and Jerome Vlikamolen out at the first corner. Ramos there on the left-hand side as we look at the replay of the start. Involved in that was Enzo Ede and also Nicky Mayer Mounoff went off into the tyre barriers in the early stages as Alex Zanardi was working hard, he losing out to Marc Basseng in the Phoenix Audi. And that contact meant that Zanardi had to come in to pit with a left rear puncture and he was out of the race. The Fortec Mercedes had made a good start running in fourth place in the early stages but they soon lost out to the HDP Mercedes. And there was the evidence of the damage from the first corner on Cesar Ramos's car which was severely affecting his handling. But he was the next man to make it past Miguel Torrell in the Fortec car up the inside into turn nine as the Mercedes started to slip back down the order. Vincent Abril had a little look to the inside but wasn't quite close enough to pass the Fortec car. As the pit stops came, it was the 84 machine of Nico Verdonk and Maximilian Goetz that took the lead of the race. Caca Bueno was frustrated. Lawrence Van Thor was now at the wheel of the number one car and he decided to do some rally crossing on the exit of turn two. He managed to emerge unscathed. A mistake from the race leader then allowed Sergio Jimenez to sweep past and take the lead of the race. A charge was on with Lucas Wolf as he tried to force his way past Alessandro Latif. But Sergio Jimenez in the zero BMW was the man in the lead, but not for long because Dominic Bauman surged past him with a superb move around the outside of turn six on the penultimate lap of the race. And it was the Schubert BMW team who took victory seemingly from nowhere in only their second event in the Blancpain Sprint Series. Dominic Bauman and Thomas Jaeger onto the top step of the podium in Slovakia, but it's still Maximilian Goetz in the HDP Mercedes that leads the championship. Slovakia was yet another frustrating weekend for Laurence Van Thor and Cesar Ramos in the number one WRT Audi. They won the qualifying race as they have done on previous occasions this season, but it's not coming together when it matters. It's actually more frustrating than, than even disappointing because we, we qualified the car in every race on the front row with two pole positions and two qualification race victories. And somehow on Sunday we don't manage to, to get any result. I think we learned in the last couple of races it's not only about being quick because we've been quick the whole season but we have to get our, our points together and uh, that's, that's our main focus uh, at the moment. After Thomas Heng's spectacular crash last time out, the writer engineering crew had to build up a whole new Lamborghini. This weekend they're also part of the G-Drive squad with Roman Rusinov. As I said the car is uh, my damage but uh, luckily you know I survived with all the safety around me, the roll cage, the seat belts, the safety is just amazing on the Lamborghini, so I actually came up from the accident without an injury. At this moment, we feel like Lamborghini is the car to have on this circuit, so we'll see it throughout the whole weekend, but uh, at this moment, we are very positive. BMW Team Brazil had their strongest meeting in Blancpain last time out at Slovakia, almost winning the main race, with Sergio Jimenez losing out with just a few laps to go. But they know it may be more difficult here in Portugal. It's a bit, uh, a bit tricky for BMW here because we have uh, turns with second and third gear. That's not our best, but I think we will not have a good qualifying, I mean, front row or something like that. When the race we are we're growing up a lot, so that's my expectation that we grow a lot in the race and that we can fight for a podium and maybe for a victory. The Bitech McLaren squad have been gradually improving so far this season and Giorgio Pantano has made some incredible starts, not least last time out at the Slovakia ring where he went from 20th to 4th at the first corner. This weekend though it may be more difficult for he and the team. We have some issues with the car at the beginning of the season, the first um, four races I would say. Uh, we probably find the problem, but we are new on this championship. Uh, we are compete with a very strong team. But I believe on this weekend uh, we can be a bit more closer. I'm sure we can do something well this weekend. They only made their Sprint Series debut in Zanvoort, but Dominic Bauman and Thomas Jaeger have been mighty impressive. Second in Zanvoort and winning the race last time out at the Slovakia ring. Will it be the same story this weekend? Here at Portimao, the BMW should be quite competitive. Uh, the fast corners, we are really good there and in slow corners we have to find our way to find a good setup but overall uh, it's always a fast car, we won last time and also with the Pirelli tyres we should be, should be quite good. 
After missing the previous round in Slovakia, Max Buk is back at the wheel of the 84 Mercedes alongside Max Goetz. But now that he's missed out on the points from Slovakia, his main focus is going to be helping Goetz to the title. I think I would try to help Maxi as much as I can because I can't really reach his uh, score of points. I think every race is a bit of a new story. As every main race we have a different winner. So I think it's a bit difficult to say who can be the main rival or not. We just focus on ourselves and I think that should be the best strategy we have. Currently leading the Pro-Am standings is Alessandro Latif and Marc Basseng. Latif has been learning from Basseng in his first real season of GT racing and last time out at Slovakia they were running towards the front. They'll be hoping to perform similarly here in Portugal. That was the first situation we've actually been like near the front so obviously the pressure was quite high for me to bring the car home safely. Uh, so for sure there's, uh, now that I've been there and I know what it's like, for sure I've got more performance to give. The Portuguese squad Sports Anew are entering two Mercedes into their home race. Both cars will be in Pro-Am. Antonio Combra and Luis Silva sharing one SLS. Paolo Pinheiro is in the other, sharing with Francisco Mora. It's very nice. The Mercedes here is, is quite good. It's quite a good car. I, I, I enjoy driving about this, this car, especially here, because it's a good circuit to the characteristics of this car. And I think that we have all the things to do a, a good result here. All teams, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Five minutes to go. Five minutes, five minutes. Feel great, feel great. Okay, Lawrence, we signal now. Okay, Stefan, in einer Minute geht's los. And green light, green light. Cars coming into final corner, they're with the starter, and we're green. Go, 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 go! A very good afternoon and welcome to Algarve in Portugal for the qualifying race ahead of the fifth round of the season in the Blancpain Sprint Series. My name is Jack Nichols, alongside me here in the commentary box is John Watson. John, yesterday we had glorious sunshine. It's not quite the same today, but it's still pretty warm. It's still warm, 27.2 Celsius, 33.7 on the track. But look above you, there is a dirty big black cloud. <laughs> it's sort of hovering over the top of the racetrack. We don't think it's gonna dump its precipitation. We never know. So the cars are making their way now around towards the final corner here on the formation lap. They're starting to line up in their side-by-side -side formation and it'll be Thomas Eng on pole position in the orange Lamborghini, the G-Drive Racing Lamborghini. The red light's about to go out, the qualifying races go here in Portugal and it's a good start for your own Blicamolen by the looks of things as they make their way down. Thomas Enger on pole position has got away well, but Blicamolen's into the lead of the race. Looking up the inside there is René Rast, but it's also a good start from Max Buch. And René Rast is going to get through into third place. All the way around the outside goes from the other WRT Audi. I think that's Lawrence Van Zor. and oh, that's a big moment. I think that was Ortelli in the nine car who really hit the, uh, hit the curbs hard and that sent him out wide. But everyone's safely through the first few corners. I think Ortelli might have got a problem for that. Yeah, into turn one and turn two, there was a problem at the back of the field. But one of the Audis, that may have been Lawrence Van Four, went right off racetrack and almost tried to make a position. I don't think he managed it, but certainly that's what I'm talking about. Abuse, in his case, more force measure. So through the hairpin of turn five they come, and now climbing up through the left-hand kink of six, but our race leader is Jerome Bleekemolen. Second place is Thomas Enger. Third is René Rast. And fourth at the moment is Maximilian Buk as they all wind their way now and start to climb the hill. Oh, the two Roal BMW BMWs have hit each other. Zanardi coming together with the 34 car, which has been right. started by left, Colombo. Left front suspension is and broken. And that is a disaster for the team. So up now they come towards turn number 14 and then into the right-hander of 15 that sees them drop down the hill and through the incredibly quick final corner and out onto the start finish straight again. So, oh, and there's going to be contact there as well. 
and that is and Alessandro Latifu sent spinning. And he's caught the right rear of the McLaren. It's also not two cars. Certainly the McLaren isn't going to go very much further by the looks of that damage. Audi may be able to get going whether there's a tyre contact. There is the BMW. That was on the exit of turn eight. McLaren has managed to get a spun run, but I think there's damage to that right rear. But now, look, the battle's on for second place. Thomas Enger under a lot of pressure from Rene Rass now as they come through the uphill left-hand flick at turn five. Down towards the hairpin of six, Thomas Enger will surely try and cover the inside line under the heavy braking zone. The Audi really strong on the brakes, not so quick in a straight line, looks to the inside, but he's not quite close enough as they come into the left-hander and now start to climb the hill again. Down the inside, that's a great pass by the BMW. The Bauman by Bauman, yes. Lazowski. Yep. So that good clean pass, that's what you can do. Safety car has been deployed. I'm not surprised there's traffic and cars all over the place. And here's a replay of the start. Blinkerbola just got a better getaway and, and took the lead of the race. Enger managed to do well to hold on to that second spot, but it's this middle black Audi here. Keep an eye on that. It gets passed by Van Thor around the outside and then goes to the inside of the Mercedes. The Mercedes then closes the door and Ortelli's forced over that uh, over that curbing on the inside. In fairness, I think you have to say Stefan was Stefan Ortelli was being somewhat aspirational and believing he was going to get that position where there's again a closing gap the Mercedes was going to take its line and the Audi wasn't sufficiently far forward gets well and truly airborne and no doubt when it crashed on not doing the left front suspension or any of the suspension any good at all so your own Bleekemolen managing the pace managing the safety car restart here because the safety car has pulled in Bleekemolen drops the throttle and away he goes let's see who can stay with him as we go back racing here in Portimao it's a good restart from Van Thor. he's right up the back of Max Book and Max Book actually has lost a few positions as they flash through this final corner absolutely fantastic to see and then there's a big old gap back to the Audi there so Marcus Winkelhock I don't know what's happened to him but he must have a problem he's coming into the pits yes. has Winkelhock got some sort of puncture I Possibly. think he may have a puncture. His car looks slightly unstable. Didn't look at racing speed coming through turn 15 as we go back to the front of the field and the two Lamborghinis. The big loser there was Maximilian Buch as if he was getting caught out. There, the second in the McLarens and Dominic Barman in the BMW having their own little private battle. And the BMW much quicker on the exit of the corner, mainly because I think McLaren took the sort of the, the line that was. Uh, and they were all Good held. for overtaking, but not necessarily quick as time. They were all held up behind Finkelhoff was the problem, and so that created a really good overtaking opportunity because obviously no one could pass Finkelhoff before the safety car came in. So that means Chris Van der Drift is up into eighth place in that McLaren. Ninth behind is Dominic Bauman. Tenth is Mateusz Lesowski. What but a he's pass. got Sergio Jimenez trying to go around the outside, but he's unable to do so. So Lesowski holds on to that tenth place. Uh, well, it's not as simple as a puncture, is it? There's been a bit, bit of concern. This is a bit of action, isn't it? Up the inside, this is still the battle between Lesowski and Jimenez. And Jimenez has finally made it through. Nelson Piquet might try and follow through as well as they come down into the right-hander. And he does so well. Lesowski's trying to hold on around the outside. That is good stuff from the pole. And he's managed to hold the place. That's going to compromise both of them, though. Here comes Stefan Lambin in the Grasser Racing Lamborghini behind. Can he try and take advantage of that battling? He looks for the inside. And yes, he's going to get both of them is he down into the hairpin good work from Stefan Landman no Lazowski's still there still holding on good racing down towards the hairpin they come and watch out for the Audi just behind this lot here we go and it's Van Thor who holds the place for the time being good racing in the middle of the pack and this is good news for Thomas Enger because he has now managed to sprint clear up in, uh, up in second place Dusseldorf trying to get along but it's the wrong side of the racetrack to go up into turn seven and then back in on the gears down the brakes into turn eight that's where the contact occurred and very close indeed within the nose of the Mercedes and the tail of the Audi but they managed to do it without contact the pit stop window is now open I'm not imagining any of the top seven or eight to come into the pits but we'll wait and see as they stream across the line now it's just well, it's less than half a second for the lead of the race your own bleak moment against Thomas Enger and what I mean what a pair to do battle that is so experienced the pair of them so quick and this is going to be a very interesting battle of wits well I think we'll again see the BMW and the McLaren down into turn one again the problem the BMW has got it is basically of all the cars here is the slowest in a straight line quick off turn 15 that's where it's gaining the advantage but we can't do very much with the uh, McLaren it's just too soon let's look and see how much of the track now that is exceeding <laughs> track limits He's into in. the pits comes I Maximilian Buch then he's coming in to hand over to Maxi Goetz 
as they come down towards Turn 1. And you know what's happened? That's released now Lawrence Van Four, who has been really trailing the Mercedes all the way through. Now he's got clear air. He's sort of going to laser into the back of Thomas Enger in second place Lamborghini. So we're at the halfway point in the race. Less than 30 minutes to go. And it's your own bleak motor leading the way. Thomas Enger there second in the G-Drive. Writer Engineering Lamborghini. Third place and fourth place are the two WRT cars of René Rast and Lawrence Van Thor. Who's uh, going to blink whoa, first? What a big moment oh, he to got Thomas it Enger squirrely, almost lost squirrely. it. And that loses him second position and third position as well. What a big moment that was for Thomas Enger. He held it all together, but has he now lost the chance to battle for the lead of the race? He's side by side with the Audi as they come down the start finish straight. But Van Thor will have the inside line and he'll move through into third place. Well, I'd like to see a replay of that because it looks like Thomas Enger turned the car in quite aggressively. But the back said, sorry, Thomas, ain't going to watch the back of the car. There she goes. He had to get out of the throttle on that one because otherwise it was going to continue going round and Rennie Rass said, thank you, Thomas. I'll take that any day of the week. All over the back of him now is Steph Dusseldorf. There is reports of rain on the circuit and I think that might even be a bit of sort of rain you can see on the camera lens and here comes Dusseldorf. He's going to get the inside line and he's going to take fourth place away from Thomas Enger. The Mercedes goes through and Enger goes down into fifth position now. It's going to be slicks for the G-Drive Lamborghini and slicks really at the moment the only option because the rain is nowhere near properly coming down, the track's nowhere near wet enough. But now we're going to have some action in the pit lane because all of these cars are going to have to peel to the right and come into the pits. Look at those clouds and uh, oh, that was a lot of speed taken through from Van Thor. So in they all come and basically the man we're going to be waiting for and look how close Dominic Bowman is now to the back of this lead pack having started well down the grid but the man we're going to be looking for is the 84 Mercedes of Maximilian Goetz he's going to be the man to watch he's in uh, ninth place at the moment he's in the second sector as it stands but will he be able to get out anywhere near these guys up at the front there's Enger handing over to Rusinov yeah I'm just I'm trying to look out of the comedy booth which is literally facing the start finish straight to see if those black clouds are actually doing anything other than hovering over the racetrack it looks dark in turn one and around turn two hasn't rained heavily enough to make anybody concerned there's the Lamborghini rolling great Sorry, project great pit stop from the whole team um, so then out in second place will come Enzo Ede. He looks like he's pulled out behind uh, Harry Project. But where is the Mercedes? There it is. Is that it there? Just coming through on the right hand side. No, it's not. It's the it's the older, um, it's the Pro-Am Mercedes. This is the one to watch out for coming down the hill now. And it is going to be the lead of the race for and Harry Project. But it's second place now for Maximilian Buch, who's but now handed over to Max Goetz. The key is he's up to speed. Harry Project's just left the pit lane. He's got fresh rubber on. He's going to be gobbled up by the German, if not into turn four, but into turn five at the half. And he's got the momentum. He's got the warm tires. He knows what the car feels like and handles like. Harry Project's going to be looking in the mirror wondering, what can I do to defend? Well, he can really try and outbreak the Mercedes, but Goetz up the inside should have the drive off the corner. He's done a Project, good job there. But Harry Project certainly is not afraid to put his foot in it. Thumbs up from Steph Dusseldorf. If Max Goetz keeps doing that, he yeah. could get telling off. And also, he ends up doing the same thing. Maximilian Goetz driving the Mercedes. Maximilian Book watching. You could see his face thinking, my teammate needs to be careful not to do that again. Again, Maximilian Goetz beginning. If we look again at the replay of Maximilian Goetz, runs wide, not only runs wide, he gets all four wheels over that red white track. If you like to call it delineation. Team manager of car 28 and 27, i.e. the Grasser Racing team manager, which is Gottfried Grasser, has been called to race control immediately. And there is Gottfried and uh, he's not quite on his way. He's about to take his headset off and head up to uh, race control by the looks of things. Down towards the final quarter comes our race leader, Harry Project. They've won two qualifying races so far this season at Browns Hatch and at Zandvoort. There is uh, Ombar running behind and he's got Enzo Ede about to make a move on him. The blue flag's being waved for the back marker as they come across the line with 16 minutes to go. Enzo Ede still the same 2.7 seconds behind. Cesar Ramos not really putting in much dent on Enzo Ede's advantage. They're lapping very similarly. Yeah, and Russia, he's Russia, now going to pass Russia, the... Uh, 
that's all got a bit close in there and do they touch? Oh, they've got very, very close as Enzo Ede was trying to lap Antonio Quambra. But here's the lead battle down into turn number one. Five and a half minutes to go. Still Enzo Ede comfortably clear of Cesar Ramos in fourth place. Uh, Thomas Jaeger, has he managed to start the close in again on Roman Rusinov? Uh, no, not really. It's still about five and a half seconds. In fact, he's got Vance on Avril right up behind him still. And uh, Bueno and Stumpf are still right together for 10th and 11th places uh, with Basseng and Stempentis in that crew as well. So battles throughout the field, but the race lead is very, very close at the moment. I'm talking about Vance a million goods. Well, it has. So this is Vance on Avril trying Absolutely. to get past Thomas Jaeger in the battle over seventh position. Abril right up behind the BMW as they come down to the hairpin. Will he fancy a look to the inside this time around? Not quite. No, Abril is leading the Silver Cup, but the car behind is second in the Silver Cup, Lucas Wolf. So this could get uh, very interesting, especially with the straight line speed of that Mercedes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, not that the, the Thomas Jago is deliberately letting the Audi draw up to the back of the BMW and, of course, letting the Mercedes draw to the tail of the Audi. Thomas Jago is doing the best he can to try and run down the sixth place Roman Rosanov in the uh, almost pole position Lamborghini and Vance Abril he's, he's very racy looking to dive down the inside not a good place to do it and uh, the door of family shut by Thomas Jaeger but Vance Abril needs to be aware that behind him he could have a challenge and a threat to what would be uh, the lead of that task Eighth place at the moment for Abril. Seventh place with the BMW in front, which is Thomas Jaeger. And then behind is Lucas Wolf in the second HTP Motorsports Mercedes. Uh, third HTP Motorsports Mercedes, I should say. Currently second, fifth, and ninth in the HTP cars. And they come out onto the start finish straight, all of them going very wide on the exit yeah, of the final. Thomas corner. Jaeger, particularly, was well and truly off the racetrack. Just quick look into the faces of Anselm Vals and Pio Dudone as again the BMW has to be defensive on the entry into turn one. Oh, I Bandit thought he was going to go for the outside there Abril but that could compromise him because here now surely will come Lucas Wolf. he's not quite close enough but uh, another moment like that and Wolf will be there to try and take advantage of that I think. Yeah that, that was I mean testy stuff for Thomas Jaeger and for Vincent Abril there was almost a point where I thought Abril could make the cutback into turn three but he didn't really have quite the ground to do it down again into turn five. You can see the front of the Audis that patters over the bumps and the braking zone as they come down that hill. So Mercedes dropping back fractionally from the tail of these two cars battling, currently over seventh place. Gap at the front is down to six cents of a second, but it's still, oh, here's the overlap for Abril. Has he managed to get it out of the corner? It's a good move from Abril, but the next hand is a left-hander. He's going to try and go all the way around the outside. Great stuff from Vance on Abril. Now he'll have the inside line and the WRT Audi goes through. We saw Abril flying at the end of the qualifying race in Slovakia and he's doing it again here. And that, as to me, is the overtake of the race so far. To do it around the outside of turn nine, up the hill into turn ten, takes, believe me, a lot of commitment. And that was what you just watched there. Young man, fully committed and going for it credit to Thomas Jaeger, he could have squeezed and pushed him, he didn't do it and uh, that was uh, good motor racing On to the penultimate lap of the race now, with Harry Project leading the way, Maximilian Goetz is behind him in second place as they turn through the right-hander once again it's these two who have been untroubled really, and only that one real attempt from Maximilian Goetz to, to get past in the early stages they come down towards the hairpin and possibly a little bit more rain out there coming just towards the end of the race not even towards the end of the race it pretty much is the end of the race but on the straight so you will maybe try to pass us directly before for turn one so that's why uh, yeah the situation happened that uh, many cars are side by side before turn one and uh, it's always, uh, you know, in a race driver's mind to, to, to gain some positions and everybody wants to gain position and that's why sometimes uh, little accidents happen. Now, do you think, Rene, if a driver at the end of a race was given a bill for the damage that he caused, that might actually improve situation? Maybe, yeah, for sure it would improve situation. But yeah. you wouldn't want to be part of that, would you? I would not race anymore, for sure. <laughs> Have a good one, enjoy it, thank, thank you. you. Great to hear from uh, Rene Rast there. 
down with John Watson on the grid and Rene will be uh, taking over that car in the second half of the race. It'll be Enzo Ede who will be starting that car and there is the Belgian driver, the bespectacled Belgian, about to put his helmet on and get ready for the start of this race which will begin in about 15 minutes time as Rene Rast then goes on for more interview responsibilities. It's all very busy down there on the grid. There is the number one car of Cesar Ramos and Laurence Van Thor who have really been one of the quickest drivers pairing so far this season, but they're only in sixth place in the championship. They had pole position in Nagaro, they had pole position at Brands Hatch, they won the qualifying races in Nagaro and Slovakia, but they've only managed to amass 39 points. They've had uh, a best result of fourth in the championship races so far this season, so it really has been difficult for them. And we can now hear from uh, Thomas Enger and Roman Rusinov. They have been joined together for the first time this weekend, and they were John. Tom Thomas, first of all, I like the new color scheme. It's beautiful. I mean, for me, the, be the most beautiful Lambo ever made in those colors. Um, it is fantastic. Uh, thanks to G-Drive in this orange color. You know, we are really proud that we can represent right. this. Let's yeah. move on, move on. Now, tell me, car. you made, in some ways, the most exciting move in the race yesterday when you nearly lost the car on turn 15. Was as ex exciting for you as it was for us? Ah, I, I thought it's over. I didn't expect the car come back. I don't know how I managed it, but I tried my best. I fight until the last moment and luckily I got it back, but it was a big moment. And uh, yeah, we were struggling with rear tires, unfortunately, but uh, I hope we got it right for today's race. But uh, yeah. Sixth place is not what we wanted yesterday. We're trying to get uh, to the front today. I mean, we, we saw the incident, but as a driver, you turn into the corner, everything looked normal, then suddenly the back end breaks away. Talk us through the exact, everything happened. Well, uh, usual usual stuff, you know, with me, I don't lose the car in a slow corner. I usually lo lose it in a corner over 200 kilometers per hour or around around this number. Uh, you, obviously, I had a, there was a strong wind uh, in that corner and it was affecting the area of the car. I turned in, uh, I had a slight oversteer, but then over the crest, uh, it became even more oversteery. And uh, at that moment, I thought, you know, it's over. But uh, for some reason, once it's landed after the crest, it got grip in the rear again and I was managed to to go around the corner. I lost two places, I lost some speed obviously, but uh, luckily I saved the car and uh, I hope it was exciting for spectators as it was for me. Excellent, thanks Thomas, it was great for us as well. Hope you have a good one this afternoon. Cheers mate. We're here in Portimao in the Algarve circuit for round five of the 2014 Blancpain Sprint Series. The main race is going to be getting underway in about 15 minutes time here at this spectacular undulating circuit. It really is a circuit that provides some very entertaining racing and it's going to be hopefully another hour of that coming up later on today. My name is Jack Nichols and alongside me in the commentary box will be John Watson. He's currently down on the grid speaking to the drivers ahead of this main race where the top of the championship is separated by just 16 points. Maximilian Goetz and then Harry Project and your own Bleak Molen are currently second in the championship. Yesterday, they managed to hold off their championship rivals to take victory. And it was Harry Project and your own Bleak Molen who managed to fend off the chasing HTP motorsport Mercedes of Max Goetz and Maximilian Buch. And they took the checkered flag in a very, very hard fought race yesterday. You can see the... Uh, eight tenths of a second between the first and second place cars at the finish line and we're hoping and we're anticipating uh, an equally uh, intense fight today so we can now hear from maximilian boot the man who will be in the second place car on the grid he's with john watson maxi book front row of the grid but your partner starting and you've got the quickest car in a straight line yeah, um, I don't think that we are faster than the Lambo on the straight line. Yes, you Ma are. Yeah, a bit. Yes, you yeah, are. I've yeah. checked the speed trap times. Yeah, but we were in the slipstream. No, Maxi, no, <laughs> no? Maxi. I don't want any of this rubbish from you. Yeah, but we will see. I don't think that we are fast enough to have more than a car length in front of the Lambo uh, in, before the first corner. Yeah, we will see. I think we have a good chance to be in front of the Audis at the start because they are not so quick on the straight line. And yeah, we will see. I mean, the start's going to be in a few minutes' time. It's a rolling start. Everybody knows what they've got to do. I mean, has Max Goetz got enough in your car? 
to maintain position and maybe get slightly ahead into turn one and avoid contact into turn one. Sure, we have a Mercedes. No, I think uh, should be we should be quite quick enough to stay minimum on P2 to, de to defend our position after the first lap or after the start without contact. And then we will see, I think, that we can put the Lambo a bit under pressure, maybe that he will do some mistakes or have to change his strategy over the pit stops. And then it's our time. Good to see you back. Many thanks. thanks. Maximilian Buk missed the last race in Slovakia and as a result Maximilian Goetz is now the man at the top of the championship on 91 points so it's basically Buk who will be trying to help Goetz to win the title this season. There is the Silver Cup pole position for Vincent Abril and Mateusz Lesowski in the number four WRT Audi and they're currently in seventh place in the championship overall. It's been a very strong season for the Frenchman on the pole and they are going to be starting in seventh place on the grid and it'll be Vincent Abril the Frenchman who will be starting the race and he has been really impressive over the past few races yesterday he pulled off the move of the race last time in Slovakia he was making an awful lot of positions up as he climbed through the field the 19 year old Frenchman who doesn't really have much racing experience 28.2 degrees the air temperature 34.5 degrees on track we haven't really had the nicest weekend here in Portugal I don't mean to complain too much but you can see that, that it's been pretty cloudy all weekend and we've had drops of rain throughout the day throughout yesterday as well but this circuit is really one that tests the drivers you can see all the undulation there and that is a real challenge it's the closest thing really to a roller coaster that uh, that you can get as far as a race circuit is concerned we're nestled in the Portuguese countryside just a few, about 25 minutes north of the town of Portimao. And we can now hear from Nelson PK Jr. He'll be starting in 10th place on the grid for BMW Team Brazil. Nelson PK Jr., nice to be in Portugal. Fala Portugues. Of course. Tem que falar um pouquinho, né? Yeah, I understand that too. Anyway, what are your thoughts this weekend? Well, you know, I mean, it's good to be here with a Brazilian crew, you know, last time I... That sounds chilled and laid back like you're on the beach, really. No, not really. I mean, uh, last time I had a Brazilian crew like this was in England, doing a British F3 championship, so it's good to be in Europe and fighting against European teams and uh, but a whole Brazilian crew with a Brazilian sponsor, Brazilian driver, so it's fun. I mean, it's a good atmosphere, it's a good championship. I'm happy to be here. Now, you race in America and all forms of motor racing. Coming back into European almost road racing, doesn't take much to adapt to it, does it? No, not at all. I mean, obviously these cars are a bit different. You know, I don't have many miles in these BMWs, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's it's just like any other race car. You know, you just need to adapt yourself to different kind of car, a little bit heavier, a little bit more power, and uh, it's just all fun. And no influence from your naughty dad, is there? No, no, my father is, uh, uh, he's teaching. Long away in Brazil. Yeah, he's taking care of business in Brazil. You know what that means? Not making more babies, I hope, but uh, just working in his, in his own company, working for his retirement. And your future. Well done. Hope you enjoyed today. Thanks, Nelson. Thank you. John Watson, uh, ever inquisitive down on the grid there with Nelson PK Jr. There is the number five car, which is going to be the lead Pro-Am car, started by Mark Basseng, who finished second here when the GT1 World Championship raced here a few years ago, leading home a, uh, or finishing second in a 1-2 with the all Inkle Mercedes outfit and the grid now starting to be cleared. We've got nine minutes until uh, the start of the race as everyone is now making their way off and uh, into the pit lane, just leaving the drivers and the mechanics on the grid. Ahead of the one hour race, there will be a 10 minute pit stop window between 25 and 35 minutes into the race. And we can now go and hear from Alex Zanardi. He had a difficult race yesterday. He's 14th on the grid. Alec, you just said you, I brought you luck last time. I hope I bring it to you today. Yesterday's race was disappointing, that Turn 8 incident. Very difficult, very difficult. It was just a question of staying in there and hoping for other people's misfortunes. But I'm not wishing anybody any bad luck, but uh, I hope I can be lucky today and I, I can go home happy. Well, you say in life you make your own luck and if anybody can do it, you're the man. I don't know. For sure, we try to make our own luck, making some setup changes. The car seemed to be good, so I hope I can gain some spots. I'm going to let you get on with your day job. See you later. Have a good one. Oh, God. Alex Zanardi there with a new gold roof, as you can see. Cycling, uh, hand cycling world champion, defended his title in the time trial just last week in the hand bike world championships, and he's continuing his focus as well on. Towards Rio 2016.
So let's have a look at the grid as they are lined up on the left-hand side. That's the pole position car and it'll be started by Harry Prochick. Alongside him on the front row, the HDP Mercedes of Maximilian Goetz. Then we have the two Audis on row two. Cesar Ramos on the right-hand side there, Enzo Ede on the left. Fifth on the grid, Sergei Afanasiev on the left-hand side. He is alongside uh, Roman Rusinov in the G-Drive racing Lamborghini. Then we've got uh, Vincent Abril and Lucas Wolf. And then the two BMW Team Brazil cars, Caca Bueno starting the zero car on the right-hand side. And uh, on the left-hand side, sorry, and on the right-hand side there was the car that Nelson Piquet Jr. will be driving that he's sharing with Mateus Stump. But there's Alex Zanardi on the right, um, Dominic Bauman uh, and Thomas Jaeger on the left there in the 76 BMW. They were the winners last time out in Slovakia and they had a strong performance yesterday until Thomas Jaeger spun at the last corner and so they'll be starting down in 13th on the grid looking to climb up the order and then we have cars that ran into trouble yesterday Nicky Mayer Melnoff starting that six Phoenix Audi after they ran into gearbox problems uh, David Fuminelli will be starting this 34 row BMW after he collected uh, Alex Zanardi yesterday and he will be starting almost at the back of the grid. No, he will be at the back of the grid. In 21st place alongside him is Francisco Mora there for the Sports and You Mercedes, which are two new entrants this weekend. The Portuguese pairing out here with Paolo Pinheiro and Francisco Mora in the 71 car and in the 72 car, Antonio Combra and Luis Silva. So the grid is now being cleared. About 30 seconds to go until the green flag lap gets underway here in the Algarve can see the drop down to the first corner always very spectacular and as far as new circuits go this really is a challenging one and this is the sort of view that the driver is going to be getting again we've got those menacing clouds above us will they have any impact they, they they dropped a little bit of rain yesterday but not enough to really affect the surface but maybe it will be a little bit more dramatic today we have had a brief spell of rain earlier on but the green flag lap now is waved and away pulls Harry Prochick in first place in his Grasa Racing Lamborghini as they head down towards the first corner only two rounds to go after this Zolder and Baku 16 points between Maximilian Goetz leading the championship starting second in the race and Harry Prochick and Jerome Bleekemolen who are in second in the championship but starting on pole in the race you get 25 points for winning and 18 points for second position so in theory that gap could come down to just nine points if it finishes as it starts but we've got a long way to go around this Algarve circuit as the cars head around now down towards the hairpin Let's have a look at how they will line up ahead of the main race here in Portugal. On pole position then, Harry Prochick alongside him on the front row, Max Gertz, the two championship challengers locking out row number one. It's a WRT second row, Enzo Ede starting ahead of Cesar Ramos as they desperately try and make their good pace into a good main race performance. Sergei Afanasiev and the new Dree Drive Lamborghini of Roman Rusinov will start in sixth spot. Vincent Abril and Lucas Wolf are starting on the next row of the grid. Those are the two cars battling at the front of the Silver Cup. An all-Brazilian row number four with Kaká Bueno ahead of Mateus Stump. And then we've got Marc Basseng starting ahead of Stem Pentas in the Bitec McLaren. And Marc Basseng is the first of the Pro-Am cars. Thomas Jaeger in 13th on the grid. Then Alex Zanardi, 14th in his new livery for this weekend. 15th on the grid, Aman Ibrahim ahead of Sasha Halleck in the second Grasser Racing Lamborghini. 17th place on the grid will be Fabian Hamprecht, hoping to make up for a poor result yesterday when Stefano Telli went off at the very first corner. 19th on the grid will be Nicky Mayer. Melnoff, he'll start in front of Fabio Anidi. Again, those two came together yesterday in the qualifying race. And then Francisco Mora and David Fuminelli complete the grid here in Portugal. John, the car's making their way around now. It's all about this championship battle. It is very much, but one thing that's got to come into play is, as I was walking back down the pit lane, very, very strong tailwind for everybody as they come down the pit lane. That also means in turn 15, the critical corner where Thomas Engel was explaining what had went, went wrong. The wind has got to affect the cars at the most critical point where the cars are just in that transitional phase. So that's something to keep an eye on. Also, rumours suggest that it is raining between the A22, the main route, that goes east-west and the racetrack and to the far end of the circuit rounds turns one seven and eight black black clouds so we saw weather have a, a small impact into the qualifying race yesterday it may well have an impact here this afternoon 
on board with Caca Bueno as he gets ready to line up in ninth place on the grid. He pulls uh, just in behind the HDB Motorsport car of Lucas Wolf in front of him. He'll be side by side with his Brazilian BMW teammate. On board with Alex Zanardi. The top two in the championship are in the top two places on the grid here in Algarve. Harry Prochik chasing Max Coates for the lead of the championship and it's Prochik who has pole position ahead of this one hour main race. The fifth round of the 2014 Blancpain Sprint Series about to get underway. There's one of our onboard cameras. He's with Caca Bueno as they will now crest the hill. They'll see those red lights and they'll wait for them to go out here in the Algarve. There we go. Here we go on board with Bueno. Who's got the best getaway as they charge down towards the first corner? It's Harry Prochik. He's away in the lead of the race. It's second position for Max Goes as they come down to turn one. Great start from Roman Rusinov in the orange Lamborghini. He's up into third place as they dive into the first corner. Everyone looks like they're safely through, but it's Harry Prochik who has the lead. He's got Goes right up behind him, not quite close enough then, third for Rusinov, fourth is Sergei Afanasyev I think in the HDP Mercedes, fifth place is the WRT Audi of Cesar Ramos, so the two Audis that started on the second row of the grid have lost a number of places, as we go on board with Caca Bueno, right up behind Mateus Stump, his teammate, looking towards the inside line on the way down to the heaven of turn five, not close enough, but Harry Brosik did a good job and he's in the lead of very, very deep on the brakes from one of the um, sports and new Mercedes, but Project did the job he needed to do. Absolutely perfect start from Harry Project. got the advantage, used that pull position and just outgunned the Mercedes Benz of Max Kurtz who was unable to do anything. I'm delighted to say somebody in these cars is listening, all 22 cars got through turn one without contact. Looking a little bit wide there though was uh, Dominic Bauman as he got pushed out to the outside. Thomas Jaeger, my apologies, starting that car. And look at that, he's getting past. Oh, I think he's got a problem. He must have a front right puncture there. And so that's a disaster for Thomas Jaeger, winner of the last race in the Slovakia ring. But he looks like he's picked up some sort of puncture and is dropping back down through the order. Indeed, that was something we didn't see. Maybe in turn six, turn seven, cars did get close. We didn't see if there was any direct contact. Takes so little to come down the sidewall of a race tire. And uh, for Dominic, uh, yes, Dominic Barman in the car right now, uh, what a disappointing start. On board we go with Caca Bueno as we head now towards the final corner. But there's our race leaders. They are nose to tail. And Maximilian Goes is pretty close to the back of Harry Prochik. Over the crest they come to complete the first lap. And Prochik knows it. He's driving right in the middle of the road. So he can do, to go defensive if necessary. And I'd say he might need to. Because here comes Max Goes looking to the inside line. Project's going to hang on around the outside, and he does so, but they both go off the track limits, and that's going to be an interesting debate. Certainly, Harry Project, in a sense, it was, he was forced to go wide. He had one option, to lift off, let the Mercedes go through, or hold position, but then having to run wide on the outside of the track. That'll be reviewed. I think it'll come down as a racing incident, nothing ventured and nothing gained by either driver or car. But certainly, while there has been no contact that we have seen, very close racing. Down the outside this time for Max Goetz, again trying to make the cutback and Harry Project the drive off the corner of the Mercedes. Lamborghini, we saw all the mirror of this yesterday, but Project made his pit stop, but this time Goetz has got it. He might have done it here. Harry Project holds the inside line. Goetz was so close to the back of him. Now he'll get the inside line into the next right-hander, and he's forced his way past. Project is still going around the outside. Brilliant driving from the Austrian. Somehow he's managed to hold the lead of the race, but we're on lap two, and he's already under massive pressure from the Mercedes behind. And I mean, great. Oh, Goetz again, trying to dive. You can't really do that there because you don't know where the racetrack is and where the off track is. So Goetz pressuring right now at every opportunity. Harry Project, the Czech driver, doing a, I mean, an outstanding job to resist this pressure. Now out they come towards the right hand of turn 14. 180 degrees this swings around and Roman Rusinov there in third place just keeping a watching brief on this battle we saw the Brazilian BMWs they lost out to Lucas Wolf and all that battling in the 86 HDP motorsport car but out of the final corner they come once again Project leading the way surely he needs to cover the inside line a little more than he did last time let's watch him he's heading over the start finish line checking his mirrors putting his arm putting his hand out the window for uh, for a little bit but He's holding the lead of the race by just under three tenths of a second at the moment. Yeah, and a slightly poor exit onto the corner. You can see what's happened. Max Kurtz is something all over the back of the Lamborghini. Can he move down the inside? The Lamborghini just closes the door, but Max Kurtz putting pressure on. Don't know quite happened to uh, Harry Project. He lost momentum just at the exit of the corner, which gave Kurtz and the Mercedes that opportunity to get almost alongside into turn three. 
down towards the hairpin of turn five. They come, here comes Gertz. Now surely he's got the job done. Project won't be able to hold that one around the outside. And Maximilian Gertz moves into the lead of the race. Roman Rusinov now will be the next man to try and get past Project. But maybe Project can stick with the Mercedes. But the championship leader, Maximilian Gertz, has found himself in the lead of the race at the main race here at the Algarve as the safety car is deployed moments after the change for the lead. And that's frustration for Max Buch but it's better to be in the lead when the safety car comes out than behind. Absolutely, and uh, that's a pass that Max Gertz tried all the, well, the lap and a half, two laps. Oh, there and there the we go, it's an Audi. Contact, yes. I think that's the Silver Cup Audi being Vincent started Abril. by Vance on Abril. Oh, ah, contact with, is that the Fortech Mercedes? It is, so I'm not quite sure how those two would have Well, that's up at turn, up together. turn nine and turn 10. Turn 10 and turn 11. Yep, it's Amani Ibrahim and Vance on Abril, and they've both been pretty heavily through the gravel. Yes, they have, and in fact, the drivers have abandoned both cars, probably in their case very wisely so, but that's why the safety car has been deployed and uh, it didn't really last long. So let's have a look at the replay of the start. Harry Brochett got a good getaway and he immediately took the lead of the race. Max Gertz tried to follow him. Look at the two Audis getting swamped in the middle there from the second row. Brochett did a good job. Rusinov did a good job to get him into third place. And Sergei Afanasiev making it through as well. So the two Russians following each other through the first corner. Everyone else was safely through. Mark Basset was looking pretty racy around the outside. But uh, it was the, the real bunch up into turn number three. But everyone managed to avoid each other. Uh, Fabian Hamprecht going around the outside. He's now in the 13th place, having started uh, in 17th, so he's made up some positions. This is on board with Zanardi, John. Yeah, I mean, it's a real traffic jam, and he has put almost a lock on. Either he did get tagged, or he might have caught the inside right wheel on the kerb on the inside. This is the view again from the Team Brazil, the zero car going down into turn one. He's got a little bit more space around him, but you see Dominic Barman then fills that space, but the car goes out to the left, and the BMW, the zero car, is able to that's Cacabueno, he's able to find clear air, clear racetrack, which is what he was thinking about, thinking that he did tag the back of the BMW ever too slightly, or well, the idea actually took. So the safety car deployed, as you can see the flatbed truck making its way, oh and there's trouble for the 30 BMW Team Brazil car, Mateus Stump has had to come into the pits. I, I just wonder, was that more than a two car incident up at the top of turn 10? Maybe it was, uh, unless it was Stump and Jaeger that came together on the opening lap and that's why Jaeger had his problem. He's been into the pits, as has Mateus Stump, but yes, we uh, will have to find out later on what happened to Amani Ibrahim and uh, Vincent Abril. But they are both out of the race, and that's why the safety car has been deployed here at Algarve. Done a good job to get those two cars. In fact, one of them had to be lifted away. The other one may have been able to be restarted and get back to the pits. But the track at that area now is clear. Looking at Vincent Vaz, Pierre Dudonne and Thierry Tassin the management and the brains of the WRT RD team. On board with the number one car of Cesar Ramos, the safety car will be coming in this lap, so Max Goat slows the pack down, and then in a minute he'll stamp on the throttle, and Harry Prochick will try and go with him, he's going very slowly around turn 14, but now he gets on it, we go on board with Prochick in second place, and that's a good restart from Maximilian Goetz, he's got a decent advantage as they come through the final corner, the man who hasn't got a great run is Cesar Ramos, he's got Enzo E right behind him, and again the two BMW Team Brazil cars are right with one another, as they come across the line then, racing resumed after a very brief safety car period, it's half a second between Goetz and Prochick, Mark Basen going super defensive, because he's getting attacked by one of the Brazilian BMW cars, who, uh, which is uh, Caca Bueno, of course, because Mateus Stump has been into the pits. And they come, and I think one of the Audis had a problem there. Yes, Cesar Ramos was off on the inside of the first corner, wasn't he? And he's now dropped all the way back to that number one car, came across the line in fifth place. He's now just slotted in behind Sten Pentas in tenth. I'd like to have a little look at that one again, down into turn one, always a busy part of the racetrack, especially after a restart. Everybody jockeys for position. And uh, the GT car vision is not maybe quite as easy as it is you know, down into turn five. It's just a traffic jam. It'll be like this for a couple of laps. The Royal BMW runs way, way off track. That's certainly exceeding the track limits, but in these circumstances, probably be given a bye because it's the first restart, first start, uh, first lap of the restart. It's Fuminelli battling with Fabio and Edi as the cars press the hill and then drop down into turn number nine that then takes them back up the hill towards 10 and 11 and there is Fabio Anini in the Vitek McLaren up behind Fuminelli and 
Fuminelli actually is looking quite racy. And oh, look at that, we're almost going three wide as trying to force his way through there was Francisco Mora in the Sports and New Mercedes. Good to see those guys looking a little more racy this afternoon. Well, that might be called local knowledge. I mean, somebody yeah. who's racing here all the time will know where you can actually stick your car, particularly in a racing situation. And that was an example of it. You wouldn't have seen many of what I would describe as the regulars in the Blancpain sprint or enduro attempt to move like that. Through the final corner come the cars. Thomas Jaeger is just at the fastest first sector of anyone, but he's 45 seconds off the back of the pack because of that pit, pit stop for him. Fresh tyres, of course, so uh, that gives him an advantage, but of course he needs more than just an advantage of fresh tyres. Here's so Wolf coming back. past Afanasiev. Oh, the two HTP cars hit each other. They are not going to be happy about that. Lucas Wolf trying to go up the inside of Sergei Afanasiev, and it's not ended well, and as a result, Wolf has now reversed back into the gravel trap. That's Lucas Stoltz furious, but he, he just let the car roll back and now he's ended at base in the gravel. Yeah, I mean, he, he went, he tried to make a move on the Akinathia uh, into turn one that was always going to be very close, always very challenged. So there's the second of the two grass racing. That beginning an incidental battle, but to go back to the incident at turn one, to me, it was the fault of Wolf. He should have just backed out and given them spell for a bit of space. Uh, and the contact consequently got the car up in the air, the second of the Mercedes up into the air, and that is not permitted to push a car wide like that, side by side. Mayor Mernoff taking two positions there, he went past Antonio Combra and Stefan Landman, and now Stefan Landman is trying to get past Combra, and this is all over uh, 15th position, and I think problem. there's a problem there yeah, for Antonio Combra. You can see the car just suddenly a big bobble, and uh, whether he caught something on the track or whether that was possibly a flat tyre going down, but he seems... Seems to have uh, got it back again. So Landsman's maybe it's also a got a problem. He's had this slowing down. So whatever the contact occurred, it may have affected both these cars. Max Kurtz, meanwhile, has pulled out a two-second advantage in the lead of this race. And now, oh, Enzo Eid, look. Enzo Eid is there as well. So we saw Cesar Ramos drop back, and Enzo Eid is now down in 18th place. So the two, uh, the two Audis must have come together. They would have come together in turn one. We didn't catch that on a replay. But we have to assume that the reason why we saw one Audi going slowly, the other Audi way, way down the field, was that they may have come together in turn one. OK, so Maximilian Goetze is leading the way. Then the two Lamborghinis behind of Harry Potter and Roman Rusinov. Sergei Afanasiev is still in fourth, despite that uh, assault from his teammate Lucas Wolf. Fifth place is for Mark Van Seng. Sixth now is Kaka Bueno. Stem Penders up into seventh. Eighth is Cesar Ramos. So those, uh, and has Lucas Wolf got a problem? Or well, is he just surprised. recovering? He's letting everyone back. No, past, I think he's he? got a problem with that car because it was a big contact with the curb. Uh, the car got airborne. It came down very heavily on one side. So I suspect there's more than just simply uh, a bit of dirt and gravel on the tyres of that Mercedes Benz. Yeah, well, he could have potentially just been pushed off. Here we go. The replay goes up the inside. He would feel actually at that point he had the corner, but once the commitment was made by as, as an athlete as it, yes, it. Um, it was never going to be a happy result. But then here, he just lets the car roll back. That's that's the that's what. Um, look, he comes off the brakes. Yes, he's off lets the brakes it roll at this point. and ends up beating himself. Yeah, he didn't intend to do it, <laughs> no, but it's the that. outcome of the consequences. So he didn't intend to put the tile and the you know the sunshades up as he went into the gravel track. And so Lansman's coming out. That was a tire cut. I suspect in the contact that we saw with the the Mercedes Benz up at turn eight. So out of the pits comes Landman, he'll be now well down towards clips, the back of the order. Clips the white line on the exit. These guys just sometimes don't learn. Race leader Maximilian Goetz, and he is 3.2 seconds clear of Harry Project. So that Mercedes looking very strong here. And if they were to take victory, that would end up taking their advantage up to 23 points, I think, at the top of the championship, which would be very healthy with only two rounds to go as we watch Number nine car there of Fabian Hamprecht, right up behind Alex Zanardi in the battle over ninth position. We're all fairly line astern at the moment. And uh, up in front of Zanardi is Cesar Ramos, who finds himself behind the Bitec McLaren of Stem Pentas. So this is a good run from Stem Pentas. Up in seventh place in the McLaren that hasn't been particularly strong and doesn't look particularly strong here as they come down to the left-hander. And in, interestingly, Sergei Afanasyev has been handed a drive-through penalty for his part in that uh, in that collision. Yes, I mean, on reviewing it, clearly the other Mercedes of Luca Wolf was alongside. Afanasyev just then shut the door on the racing line. He felt that he had the corner. The other car, Luca Wolf's car, was there. It doesn't vanish. It's not a magician. And that was the reason why he's been given that penalty. He's been adjudged to be the fault of Sergei Afanasyev. 
there you can see it drive through penalty for car 85 at the top of the screen for causing a collision so we've already had 15 minutes gone in this race only 10 until the pit stop window opens and there in third place is Roman Rusinov with uh, Afanasiev behind him so that will promote Mark Basseng up into fifth position and a sixth place uh, sorry up into fourth position and then fifth place for Caca Bueno no further action for the accident between the WRT car of Vance on Abril and the Fortec Mercedes of Aman Ibrahim. No further action uh, after their incident at the top of the hill. Well, I've got to catch your breath. I mean, this end of the racetrack, nice, bright, and sunny. Far end, end of the pit straight. And the corners around there, you probably have to take your sunglasses off. It's that dark. Max Gertz, as uh, we've seen drive through penalty for Sergei Afanasiev, Max Gertz is really rocketing away at the front of this race. He crosses the line to do a 1 minute 45.697 and as we see Afanasia coming into the pits, that means he's built his lead gap up to 6.4 seconds at the front of this race. Really impressive from Maximilian Goetz. He's lapping a second a lap quicker than Harry yeah. Project behind. I mean, I mean, the simple reason is that he's got the clear air, he's able to drive the racetrack, choose where he wants to put the car, and right now you have to say Max Goetz, regardless of whether a Mercedes or a Lamborghini is the quicker of the two cars, you have to say Max Goetz is the quicker of the two drivers. I mean, a great job by Harry Kocek, we saw that qualifying race yesterday, we've seen it in Slovakia and elsewhere, but when it gets down to the, you know, the, what is professional motor racing, Max Goetz is the professional driver. Absolutely. Back straight they come, down towards turn number five, and this is the battle we're in between Francisco Mora and Nicky Mayer Melnoff, the 71 Sports for You Mercedes. As I say, they weren't, uh, they've had, uh, it's been a big step up to join the Block Pan Sprint Series for their home race, but they're starting to get into it now, battling with the likes of Phoenix and Nicky Mayer Melnoff over 13th position at the moment. And Mayer Melnoff is right up behind the Portuguese race. We've got a much better exit as they climb up the hill out of turn eight. Wonder if he can do anything with that up towards 10. No, not yet. Yeah, but remember the Mercedes has got that like 5.5 litre V8 engine, masses of torque. And if you have a good traction, lots of torque, you're going to drag the car up out of those uphill corner at the exit of those corners and again it's a little bit of local knowledge but at this level at this point it's not going to really pay too much advantage as uh, Nicky Mayer-Melnhoff will be probably building ahead of steam as he is wont to do. Fabio Anidi is now settling into a battle with David Fuminelli in front of him and here comes that squabble in a few cars time there there's Fuminelli and there's Anidi and then behind him is uh, Lucas Wolf, but Wolf is further down, he's a lap down after his spin and trip into the gravel. What's Nicky mayer Manoff got here as he comes out of the final corner and across the line? A message from uh, the race director saying track limits must be respected. And I was speaking about this earlier with the race director and he doesn't want to ruin the race because of track limits. So if you go off a couple of times, you know, no worries. It's only if you gain a clear advantage that, that it will be penalised. Yes, I mean, we've seen a number of incidents already where drivers have been locked offline, there have been about two car widths offline. In some cases, as we see there, coming out through the exit of turn four, is that an advantage to uh, any of those drivers or cars, or is it just, is it just motor racing? You, you do it until you get the warning, and you get three warnings, then you will be penalised. Coming out of turn five also is a favourite spot to overrun the exit of the corner, the, the track limits. It's, it's an increasing issue, it's a bugbear of mine, that uh, the track limits are there to be observed and you're meant to drive within them and you're not meant to use them to your advantage and even you might sometimes claim force measure there are other options available to a driver here we can see the gap coming down between Alex Zanardi and Fabian Hamprecht and Hamprecht is going to try and make a move this is the battle over 8th position Hamprecht having started down in 17th place after Stefan Ortelli went off the circuit on the first lap yesterday and Hamprecht trying to climb back up the order yeah, it's interesting watching Amprek what he's trying to do. He's trying to position his Audi in such a way that he gets the benefit of the exit of the following corner. He did it coming through turn 10 and turn 11, uh, but it wasn't any space to find a way past Alex and Audi. Now, really, between 14 and 15, nothing to do. Through 15, you just really hang on and hope that uh, you've chosen your line cleanly and you don't sort of get caught by a part of this strong tailwind that's pulling the cars all the way down. Yes, Alex Zanardi just having to wipe some of the sweat. He's almost looking more... Yeah, I mean, you can just see that the, the circuit has changed in character. The, the bumps that this track initially never seemed to have, now that everything is settled, 
it's settling following the sort of the, the concours of the, the natural topography and it is a bit bumpy out there. Single seater drivers complain of headaches from the from the start finish straight because it's so bouncy. I said that yesterday. Did I? Well, I'm just repeating myself. There's nothing new for you. So uh, 40 minutes to go here in the Blanc Pan Sprint Series at the Algarve. Max Gertz is now leading by nine seconds, nine and a half seconds now after the first sector of this lap. He is absolutely on it, comfortably the quickest man on the circuit. Sten Pentus is at the moment the second quickest man on the track. He did a 1 minute 46.6 on that last lap. So the man in sixth position will be closing in on the back of Caca Bueno before too long. Yeah, so I Sten mean, Pentus really impressive in the McLaren. But let's not forget, he's in the McLaren. Yeah, exactly. we, we don't often get to say something that's really strong and positive about the McLaren. We did a bit last year with uh, the, the team. Sebastian yeah, Boemi, yeah, but uh, not Boemi, no. Yeah, I'll get it there eventually, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was good that the McLaren has found some competitiveness, and then, of course, Chris van der Drift will be in that car later. So, quality drivers coming to the team. Spectacular final corner at Algarve, where we saw Thomas Enger have a big moment yesterday. There is the second-place car of Harry Prochik. Roman Rusinov is pretty close to the back of Prochik by the looks of things on the... Uh, on this lap. Interest just watching the two Lamborghinis, the Grasher of the first of these two cars, the Ryder car. I think the Grasher car looks the more compliant as it comes through the corner. The uh, Ryder car looks like it's a bit stiffer across the front. It's just lifting that inside front wheel. Now, whether that is to its advantage or detriment is difficult to tell, but there are subtle differences between the setups within what the car regulations allow. 39 minutes remaining, there is the battle we were talking about, Sten Pentus currently in 6th place, chasing down Caca Bueno in the BMW Team Brazil car in 5th place up in front, and then in front of them is the Phoenix Audi of Marc Bassin, currently leading the Pro-Am class. Maximilian Goetz has just set the fastest first sector of anyone, and his first sector was 8 tenths of a second quicker than Harry Prochik behind, so Maximilian Goetz is absolutely flying out there in the, uh, in the HDP Motorsport Mercedes. Yes, and what can you say? They've got straight line speed, they've got two great drivers, they've got the car hooked up as Alex and Hambrecht Hardy. is past, Hambrecht yeah. has got past somewhere on this lap because they crossed the line uh, with about half a second between them, but Hambrecht has found a way past, so he's now up into eighth position. Yeah, he's been, he's been working the back of the BMW for the last three or four laps to try and find that way on board with Alex and So, comes to turn 14, no, they go on to turn 11, then the, the, the roller coaster ride down and small compression through turn 13. Next man who's again joining this fight is the Mercedes that's a lap down, Lucas Wolf, down in 20th position, but he'll still want to get involved in this scrap, no doubt, and try and make as much progress as he possibly can. As they come out now and towards the final corner once again, the HDP car that had a drive-through penalty for Sergei Afanasyev has emerged in 16th position some nine seconds behind uh, Antonio Combra up in front of him. So here comes the attack from Lucas Wolf, not for position. He's just unlapping himself from the eighth place, uh, sorry, 11th place man Fabio Anidi looking to the outside at the first corner and goes all the way off the road. And that'll, I mean, if that is a pass, it'll have to be given up. It's not a pass whether he backed off and let the McLaren take its position, but he's certainly back on the tail and giving it a slight assist as they come through turn three, then up the hill, turn left, through turn four. He's going to have a little look down the inside into turn five if he's got the, the drive, which he thinks he's got. You can see him, well, he thought better of it this time and didn't. Uh, the McLaren late on the brakes, not giving the Mercedes any chance to, to give that little look down the inside. This is Roman Rusinov, who's been caught by Mark Bassang in recent laps. There's only four tenths of a second between them in the battle now for third position. Harry Prochik is 1.6 seconds further up the road from these guys, and then it's now 12.4 seconds for the race leader, Maximilian Goetz. One more lap, and I think you're going to see this red or orange, as it is, uh, Roman Rusinov driven Lamborghini coming into the pits because pit lane will be open in just one and a half minutes' time, and that's just under the time it takes to do a lap. Thomas Enger, no doubt, will be suited and booted and helmeted and whatever to get into the car. Um, of course, the same will apply to. Harry Project in the second place. has got the inside line at the second part of 14. They almost touch each other there as they come now into the final corner, but Basseng was very close. But no banana. No banana just yet. But let's see what he's got down the start-finish straight. The Audi tucked right up behind 
the Lamborghini as they come across the finish line. This is the battle for third position and just a tenth and a half between them as they cross the line. Also worth keeping an eye on Caca Bueno. Basseng looks to the inside. Caca Bueno will be the quickest man of anyone. Oh, Rusinov's gone wide and he's going to lose both positions. And that means Basseng is up into uh, third place. It's fourth for Caca Bueno. Fifth now for Roman Rusinov with Stempentis challenging him, trying to get around the outside and then the inside line for turn four. Good stuff from Stempentis. The Estonian is up into fifth. Roman Rusinov is dropping back down the field like no one's business because uh, Cesar Ramos has just gone past him as well. Yeah, I mean, one little almost but misjudgment error, whatever you wish to call it, from the Russian driver in turn one, opened up the door for four cars to fit to three at once. You lose your momentum as he did, even, it, was, it was never going to be a real overtaking maneuver. So just seen yeah. Stefan Landman given a drive through penalty for a pit stop infringement. I wonder if that was him going over the white line on pit exit. As, as well, he, he certainly, I mean, he, he did go over the white line at pit lane exit, albeit at the last foot of it, but that, if he caught it, it was caught on camera, it would have been reviewed, and maybe that, maybe there was something else in the pit lane. Let's like like watch Rusinov. again and see. And Mark Bessang just, I mean, just ran out of, ran out of route. He just, too, on the inside, he couldn't turn the wheel because he knew if he did something you know, aggressive, the car would probably spin. Caca Bueno had been watching that all the way down the straight, expecting something to happen. Into the pits then comes Maximilian Goetz. I thought they might have kept him out for longer, but I suppose they've got a 13.2 second advantage over Harry Prochik. Look, there's the race leader in the pits, and then we're still waiting. Here comes Prochik, you can hear him coming, and he dives into the pit lane to hand over to your own bleaker moment. So that means Marc Basseng is going to move into the lead of the race now and it's all about the pit stops. We've seen good ones from HDP and Grasser so far this season. We've also seen slow ones from the pair of them. There is Bleekemolen waiting, Brochick coming in. But how is the HDP pit stop getting on? That's going to be the first to head out of the pits as they climb out and swap drivers. Yeah, it's a bit of a skill to do this, Harry Project. The more difficult task to unwrap himself around the, the, the crash structure in the car. Getting in, you can sort of lift, get your legs and then slide in. Project runs clear of the back of the car to make sure there's no issues as they suffered from last time. The Mercedes is rolling. The Lamborghini's off as Jack, so it's going to be running. So it's a good stop from both teams, and it's almost, you have to say, fractioning to the advantage of the Grasher team. We'll see what happens. They're about to come out of the pits now. And we'll see well, how... Well, it was nine seconds before the pit stop. It's not nine... Well, maybe it is by the time he gets down to the white line. So it probably is pretty much even, Steve. It was 12 seconds, and he's just crossed the line now, and that is 13 seconds, I make that, between the two cars heading out. But look how busy it is behind. Alex Zanardi is side by side there with, I think, uh, um, Stefan Ortelli now in the WRT Audi. And uh, Ortelli has squeezed him out, and he has taken the position. And there's Thomas Enger coming out. And so that must have been a slow pit stop from Reiter because they've lost a number of positions again. Enger is now behind the likes of Alex Zanardi. Here's our race leader, though, meanwhile, Mark Basset yet to make his pit stop and he's probably going to stay out for as long as possible before he, before handing over to his amateur teammate Alessandro Latif and there are our top three on the road at the moment Caca Bueno running strongly up in second for the time being but they haven't made these pit stops but that man there, Stem Pentas really good job from him so far as Bueno comes in and he'll hand over to Sergio Jimenez but Stem Pentas and the McLaren has done a great job look at this on board yeah. Caca Bueno just, just watching those cars coming over turn 15, the crest. McLaren looks the most skitterish of all three cars. BMW looks really well planted, lots of downforce. So uh, the speed in the McLaren clearly is not just Ooh, in its... Oh, very close. Was that? that was Did very close between uh, the 27 car, I think, of Sasha Halleck heading out and the BMW coming in. So that will no doubt compromise the BMW and it could see another... Uh, penalisation for the 27 car because that seemed to me to be an unsafe relief. There's an uh, unsafe oh, release. There's Sergio Jimenez getting strapped in by Kaka. Shuts the door with uh, probably a bit of frustration by the looks of things. Into the pits also is Enzo E to hand over to Rene Rast. Surely even Rene Rast's miracle recovery drives can't help them out this afternoon. No, you're going to need really a safety car intervention to get this field all packed up together again unless there's something unforeseen. Don't expect it. 
So a lot of work going on on the pits tonight. He's still trying to get that car off the jacks just to drop. No. This is big so. trouble. This is big trouble for the Zero car. Uh, Jimenez is not moving anywhere and he's lost a number of positions. Now Alex Zanardi's on the attack, trying to go past Stefan Ortelli into the first corner. Holds the inside line. Ortelli runs way off the circuit. Zanardi's still there on the inside and he gets through. Alex Zanardi passing Stefan Ortelli. Irrepressible. You couldn't imagine anybody but Alex Zanardi trying to make a maneuver like that on someone as competitive as Stefan Ortelli, but both drivers gave each other room to work. I mean, I'm sure Ortelli didn't do it voluntarily, but he realized that Zanardi is there and he's not going to give it up. Remember, the BMW has got good grip. That's where its strength lies. It's not a top speed, but he's slanting him around yeah. into turn five there. Does that give Ortelli a chance to get a run back up the hill and into turn six, then through into the right-hand turn seven? Doesn't look like it. Not quite close enough, Stefan Ortelli. And they've got Thomas Engel. That's the car right I'm going to watch. Because Thomas Esenga has got a quick car and uh, he will try and make progress. He doesn't want to get bogged down behind the back of Zanardi, who may well be holding up the Ortelli. Uh, and uh, there we see the McLaren finally in. Yep, Stem Pentis handing over to the New Zealander Chris van der Drift. And there is Stem shutting the door and trying to uh, create as little collisions as possible as the car gets ready to head out just the front right left to go it'll be interesting to see where they come out so we will now see the HTP Mercedes going uh, through and retaking the lead of the race now uh, oh no Mark Bassing's still out he hasn't left the pits and he's all very close in there and that cost Chris van der Drift time in the Biotech McLaren he had to wait for the uh, Grasser Lamborghini and one of the Royal BMWs to head out as well so through there comes your own Bleekermolen here come the BMW team Brazil cars and they're going to be, look at them, all queued up behind Stefano Colombo at the wheel of the Royal BMW. So they've lost a reasonable amount of time there, Stem Penders and Chris Van der Drift. They're now back behind their teammate, Giorgio Pantano, and behind uh, Nicky Mayer Mountoff and Marcus Vingelock. So that has really not gone well for the 61 Bitec McLaren. Real shame because they were looking strong. Stefano Telly, I think, has got a problem because he's dropping away from the tail of Alex Zanardi in the BMW and has brought Thomas Enger right into play. So he's going to be looking to make a manoeuvre to get ahead of the idea of Otelli as the car feels the way through turn four, up the hill and then down into the braking at five. So Mark Bassang staying out once again. So this will be his last lap around, I imagine, before handing over to his AM teammates in that Pro-AM pairing. But he's giving them a very, very strong chance of a good result. Their best result so far this season came in the last race in Slovakia and they'll be looking to keep up at performance. This is going to be a reasonably straightforward manoeuvre, I think, for Marcus Vingelhock to pass Sasha Halek. Well, maybe not. A little uh, bit of a touch as they come through the left hand. I think you want to revise that view. As they come, this is a different group of cars coming up the hill now. Into turn 11 again, this group. Again, look at the contact that's taking place. Almost just goes the other way, cuts back one way, then drives up the inside into turn 13, gets the place this time. And that's a bit of good work from Mark Schwickelhock. He's thought through where he needed to be on the racetrack to ensure that he got through cleanly on the entry to the corner rather than having to battle mid-corner or on the exit. Well, the frustration for them is that this 27 Lamborghini has been through the pitch three times and is running last of all our runners with uh, Sasha Halleck at the wheel. So that'll be frustrating for them to be losing time behind that machine as their cars come across the line. Basseng still out there he'll be coming into the pit soon as will Francisco Mora there are two cars that have yet to make their mandatory pit stop change no and Sergei Afanasyev he hasn't come back in for a for a pit stop change either your own bleak and the gap between he and Max Buch is 11.8 seconds and we'll keep an eye on what sort of lap times those guys are churning out they're currently fourth and fifth but it will be first and second once everyone has made their mandatory pit stop surely Basseng he might have time for Another? No, not quite. So he comes into the pits now to hand over to his teammate Alessandro Latif. Will Francisco Mora stay out there or will he be able to get one more lap? And I don't think he will. No, probably not. But I think the key to all this is now that the thing has filtered its way through. We've got Maximilian Book in the lead in effect. And uh, second base, Jerome Blakerman. And all Maximilian Book's got to do is we see a good move up the inside. Giorgio Pantano yeah. initially going past and then um, Marcus Winkelhock following through as they pass Stefano Colombo. Yeah, but all I'll go back to Book and to make Jerome Blakerbull and he's got a big task. He's got to run down the Mercedes. All the Mercedes has got to do is judge his pace against that of the Lamborghini and the 11 second advantage that he enjoys 
is uh, going to be something almost disappointing. Into the pits there, we just saw coming Francisco Mora. So there's our race leader coming down into the first corner. Maximilian Buch has retaken the lead of the race then. And there is the, the 71 Sports a new Mercedes that decided to come in. Now where is Alessandro Latif going to come out? Across the line now comes Laurence Vanthor, so it's going to be close between he and Vanthor. So essentially it's going to come out in third, fourth position because Vanthor goes through. So I think that's third place for the number one Audi. Fourth place for Alessandro Latif. That's very impressive stuff from the Phoenix Audi squad. They've done a good job this afternoon. Yeah, so I mean far. a good job in fact is largely due to the drive of Marc Bessang. Staying out late, using the clear track and using the, the ability to run again at a pace that he can extract from us. Audi hands over to Alessandro Latif in fourth place. Whether Latif has got what it takes to consolidate that, it depends just how close behind uh, fifth place is. The 72 car currently in the hands of Louis Silva, running down in 18th position at the moment. And he is uh, fourth in the, sorry, third in the Pro Am standings makes his way around there's our race leader the 84 car Maximilian Buch and they are also leading the championship well Buch isn't but his teammate Maximilian Gertz is the pit window is now closed and really this is going to be a 25 minute I mean, maybe not cruise for, for Max Buch but he's got a good 12 second advantage over that man there Jerome Bleakmolen in second place yeah we, we queried the decision for the 84 Mercedes Maximilian Gertz he came in relatively early in that 10 minute pit stop window to give the car over to Maximilian Buch. Maybe that was a good judgment, but we weren't aware of well, all they did the information. That yesterday, of course, and, uh, well, and gained a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, it is about getting in, getting out cleanly, and it's also about where you actually rejoin the track so that when you come onto track with fresh tyres, you can get the maximum benefit from those. And in those early three, four laps and clear traffic, you can do a lot of good work. Now, this is a battle with uh, Alex Zanardi right in front of Stefan Otelli and Thomas Enger behind. And I mean, you look at the quality of the, the Blanc Pan GT sprint field and, and you have to say this is a good example of it. Two former Formula One racers uh, with a Le Mans winner sandwiched in between them, all doing battle over fifth position. So Zanardi is fifth in the Royal BMW, sixth is Stefano Telli in that black WRT Audi and seventh is Thomas Enger in the orange Lamborghini from su drive Surprisingly, I thought maybe Thomas Enger would have been able to make better progress but uh, he's seemingly unable to do anything about Otelli and I think Otelli now looking he feels he's seen enough on the back of Zanardi's BMW I think he feels it's time to try a maneuver certainly closing up to him into turn three looks down the inside into turn five and it's a very long way he's come from behind but he makes the move stick can Zanardi make the cutback no Thomas Eng is going to think about a maneuver now not through the left hand turn six but dive down the inside into turn seven it's a risky place to do it chooses not to. So that's fifth place now for Stefano Telli in the WRT Audi. Sixth place for Alex Zanardi with Thomas Enger still there in seventh. Rene Rast has just set the fastest first sector of anyone. He's right up behind Marcus Vingelhoff in the battle over eighth place. But Thomas Enger is the next man to try and attack Zanardi in the BMW. BMWs haven't been particularly strong here. It's not a circuit that suits them that well. And Zanardi's done well to be, to be running this high up the order. The second highest BMW is his teammate Stefano Colombo who's down in 11th place through the left-hander Thomas Enger trying to get a good run out and find a way through but he's not quite close enough yet no but he's gonna to have to wait he's just have to be patient because the place where he's gonna have the benefit is now acceleration off turn 14 try to get into position into turn 15 and uh, on the exit the BMW is good on the exit a lot of downforce the Lamborghini also good but stretching the difference of the way the BMW has stretched that little advantage through the downhill double right hand corner. Across the line they come to complete the 20th lap of this race. 22 minutes to go in the Blanc Pan Sprint Series at Algarve. And this is the battle over sixth position. Thomas Enger, the man who took pole position yesterday morning, chasing down Alex Zanardi. Now he's going to think about. Well, I saw Otelli make a nice little move one lap ago. All the work started here at the exit of turn four. Took a big, big gamble coming from a long way behind Alex Zanardi to dive down the inside. Zanardi gave him room to make the maneuver again. Well, could I, say, could I say that again? Just to say he could think about going down the inside. Thomas Enger does it. He goes through then past Alex Zanardi and is up into sixth position. He will start to chase down Stefano Telli now. And that'll be interesting if they can close in on Alessandro Latif, because Latif is currently in fourth spot. But he's the AM in the Pro-AM pairing there. And so Ortelli and 
Enger may well be able to close in on him in the remaining 21 minutes of the race. Uh, Caca Bueno and Sergio Jimenez are under investigation for a pit stop infringement. And here's a look up the inside. This is Mateo Stump going past Francisco Mora and moving up into 16th place. No, my apologies. It's um, They've swapped over. So it's PK going past Mora's teammate, which is Paolo Pinheiro. And uh, that's the move for 16th position. Carlo and Pinheiro almost sort of was shocked by suddenly having Nelson PK Jr. diving down the inside. And he sort of went, oh, turned left and then gathered it all back up again. So there is Nelson Piquet Jr. up into 16th position now. So 15th and 16th for the two Brazilian BMWs having started together on the fifth row of the grid. And now this is a battle with Chris van der Drift, currently in 11th place. And this is the HDP Mercedes behind that's still a lap down. So this is still just uh, Lucas Stoltz now at the wheel trying to unlap himself as he goes through the order. Now Rene Rast is right up behind Marcus Winkelhock in the battle for eighth position. The two Audi's doing battle, the Phoenix Audi ahead of the WRT Audi, and they're both, I think, closing in on Alex Zanardi, yes, they were about a second quicker than Zanardi on that, no, two seconds quicker than Zanardi on that last lap, so it won't be long before the Audis are right up behind the BMW. Uh, absolutely not, and you know that these two Audi drivers, basically, nothing to choose between them, but we have seen inspirational moments come from Rene Rast in the last number of events, and if anybody's going to drag a performance on the closing stages of a race, you have to look to Rene Rast, but Marcus Winkelhock has just about won as many races in one of these Audis as Rene Rast has. A real pair of Audi aces then down towards the right-hander of Turn 8, then starting to climb up the hill. Both of them, as we say, closing in on the back of Alex Zanardi in seventh place. There's Nicky Mayer mount off. <laughs> he's, always got, uh, he's always got some energy, hasn't he? Something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's just uh, such an enthusiast. He loves his motorsport so much. And when things don't go right for him, he gets you know, very emotional about it, expresses it emotionally. Thomas Enger, meanwhile, is closing in on Stefan Ortelli for fifth place. Not really close enough yet, but he has taken half a second out of him in the first two sectors alone. Now, looking for the outside is Rene Rass. Tries to turn in to get a bit of a cutback in the battle with Winkelhock. Down towards the final corner they come, and Rast is tucked right underneath that rear spoiler. Watch through turn 15, watch the camera shot. Both cars stable, of course, the Audi behind, uh, Rene Raskar losing a bit of front down force as they drop down into the compression on the edge of the 15. But he's got a run going, but Ma Ma Marcus Winkelhock ain't going to give it up easy. That is absolutely certain. And they are now both just four tenths of a second, uh, sorry, 1.2 seconds behind Alex Zanardi in front. So it's 1.2 seconds from Zanardi to Winkelhock and 0.4 seconds from Winkelhock to Rast. There you can see the three of them all starting to close in on one another for seventh position. This is the second between Ortelli and Eng in the battle over fifth place. And they're now just three and a half seconds behind Alessandro Latif for fourth. So all the battles are coming together quite nicely in the remaining 18 minutes of the race here in Portimao. Benny Rash ran pretty wide on the exit of turn four. He needs to be aware of that because uh, if he gains any time or gains an advantage, that will be noted. So this battle, three cars, Alex Zanardi, uh, with Marcus Winkelhock as close as you want to get without losing his own momentum. And uh, Rene Rast is now going to be thinking beyond Marcus Winkelhock, thinking about what Zanardi going to do, where is he going to be potentially holding up Winkelhock, because where can I take my car, position it in such a way, in a way you can see the way he's beginning to do so as he came through turn nine, to reposition his car from what would be maybe his normal line to give him that opportunity to get a run on Winkelhock. cars flash past all in the battle over seventh place Alex Zanardi leading the way in that 33 row out BMW he's had a reasonably good season so far Zanardi a few difficulties here and there but the highlight being his return to Brands Hatch where he picked up a fifth place finish in the main race having started down at the back of the grid that was a really strong performance look at that sideways as they came through the final corner from Marcus Vingelhock and he's going to be right behind the BMW the BMW is good through that final corner though and uh, you can see how quickly they've been closing in on Zanardi over the last three laps there. Yeah, I mean, Winkelhock now putting his nose into the mirror of the BMW. Well, the BMW is strong, is in turn 15, it's got a lot of downforce, the car looks the most stable of all. Of course, following behind Rene Rass, he's getting all the dirty air off, not the bit, oh, up the inside. Well, not far enough up to think about it, but Rast is. He's going to have a little look now because he's going to be in position as he comes out of turn four to have a look down the inside into turn five. So that's the opportunity that Rast has been waiting for 
It's a question of whether man for Marcus Winkelhock is going to give him the opportunity to do so. Not this time. Goes Here to comes the outside. Winkelhock. Oh, that's very, very bold. And he forces his way past Zanardi more than anything. Zanardi had to give him space because Winkelhock was coming whether he liked it or not. Zanardi a little look in the mirrors as he wonders whether Rene Rast is going to go past him as well. And the answer is yes, around the outside. Damn. So that is now Winkelhock up into seventh place with Rast into eighth. Good mode racing from three professional drivers. Well done by Marcus Winkelhock into turn five. Great job by Rene Rast in and around the outside in turn seven. Not a corner you see anybody really attempting that manoeuvre on. So Alex Zanardi has had to concede to the pace of the two Audis as they have continued their battle now for what would be seventh place. Yep, absolutely. And this is, meanwhile, as Sandro Latif up in fourth place. Right up behind him is Stefan Otelli. So Otelli has really closed in on Latif as they were making their way through the traffic and so we've now got a three car train for fourth position because Thomas Enger is coming as well Maximilian Buch is still leading this race 13 seconds clear of your own Bleeker Molen with Lawrence Van Thor running in third and they're all lapping at a pretty similar pace Van Thor actually is the quickest of all of them and he's only five and a half seconds behind Bleeker Molen but with 15 minutes to go I think that's going to be a bit of a tough ask but this is Alessandro Latif leading the Pro-Am class that's their main focus but they'd love a strong performance and uh, it's those two no, it's not their teammates, is it? It's just Mark Bessang's teammate. We'll see how quickly it'll, how soon it'll be that Vickelhock joins the party. But out now they come. Is this going to be an, an opportunity for Ortelli? Down into turn five. We've seen him make a few moves. Latif knows it. The Anglo-Italian covers the inside line and then heads back to the outside line. Here comes Ortelli, late on the brakes. Gets the job done. And that was just, he's just so committed, Ortelli. He goes for it, he goes for it. Yeah, I mean, that's good motor racing. You make your commitment and you stick with it. And Latif gave him the room, he made it as tough as he could, but he saw that Ortelli was coming down the inside, and once somebody has launched themselves down the inside to try and shut the door, is only going to end up with contact and you know, positions lost to both cars, maybe even being exited from the event. So how quickly now can Thomas Enger get past Alessandro Latif? Up towards the crest of the hill they come, and uh, they'll be, he'll be hoping to get past pretty quickly, because otherwise Ortelli will start to scamper clear in that fourth position. Watch up into turn 13. That's where Thomas Enger might have a little thought about diving up, but it's been covered by Latif. So he was wise to that particular move from the Czech driver. So again, it's frustration. He's going to go the long way around turn 14. He's not far enough forward, but he can make the cutback and try and get underneath the idea as they come out of 14. He's hanging on the outside. I'm not quite sure the point of doing so. Again, Latif being very aggressive in his defence. That's something that, again, personally don't like to see, but young guys, amateurs. They're here at the races. Out onto the start, finish straight, they come. This battle, which is over fifth position. Alessandro Latif defending along the inside line. Thomas Enger trying to find a way past, looks to the inside. He's got the overlap, and he will surely manage to get through now into fifth place. Latif tries to carry more speed. Oh, he, he was going for the cutback, but he just got out of shape. Yeah. And Roman Rusnov, very happy with that. Yeah, that was a good move. And I mean, uh, Thomas Enger, I think he, did, he played a bluff on Latif because I think Latif thought that Enger was going to go back to the left and therefore that would give Latif the line. But in fact, Enger hung out to the right, tied against the pit wall and got track position. And Latif wisely then accepted that his position was gone. So Thomas Enger able now to make progress and he's going to move up into fifth place. But Ortelli is a little bit further up the road. Now this is the battle and uh, Rene Rast has got past. So Rene Rast is past Marcus Finkelhock and up into seventh position by the looks of things, there's the number two car, ahead of the number six car, they were in the other order when they crossed the line. So Rast has found the move, and he is now up into seventh place, about three and a half seconds behind Alessandro Latif. So they may be able to catch him before the end of the race as well. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of more takes into turn five. It's the sort of place of choice on the circuit. It's relatively easy to do, and uh, you know, if you do make a mistake, you don't get penalised too heavily for so. But Marcus Winkelhock has had to concede that position and eventually to Rennie Rast. Uh, the gap's still very much the same. The pace these two drivers have been running at, almost identical. But just that one moment when uh, Marcus Winkelhock was vulnerable, Rennie Rast jumped and got the position. Maximilian Buch still leads in the HDP Mercedes. There he is. And, uh, he is 12.2 seconds clear of your own Brickamoto in the grass, a racing Lamborghini in second place. So, this, in theory, if it stays like this, will extend their championship lead by seven points, which will take them to 23 points clear. And uh, there is Max Buch. 
great to have him back in the championship after missing out in Slovakia. So he can't really win the championship, but I'm sure, despite the points Devon did, if he and Goetz, if Goetz wins the title, it'll feel like a championship. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the, the contribution that Max Burke has made to this partnership over a number of years, whether it's with Goetz or other drivers, uh, is very important. He's a, an outstanding young German GT race driver. And, uh, I mean, there are reasons why he hasn't been in the car. We didn't need to go into them at this particular point. But he would have been an asset to that uh, car, the two races where he wasn't available. Absolutely. There's your own big man who's an asset to any car. Grassi team can't give him enough plaudits, really. No. So. I mean, the, what Blake has done is take a relatively small family-run team and given it all the expertise and experience and of the two Lamborghinis, the Ryder car and the Grasser car, this is the car, Blake Mullen behind the wheel, that looks, well, this is the idea in fact, looks the better of the two cars on track. So whatever work Blake Mullen does, it seems to just give that little bit more compliance to the Grasser Lamborghini. Yeah, that was the third place Laurence Van Thor WRT Audi we saw. Then we've got the this fourth Ortelli. place Stefan Ortelli with Thomas Enger reasonably far behind now in the bright orange Lamborghini Ortelli defending champion of course of the Blanc Pan Sprint Series winning it last year with Laurence Van Thor but I'd be surprised if either of them are able to uh, win the title this season unfortunately for them less than 10 minutes to go here at Algarve and now Alessandro Latif is under pressure he's got Rene Rast up behind him as they come down towards the first corner and following in is Marcus Winkelhock in the Phoenix Audi. So three Audis going nose to tail, and Latif might be able to help out his teammate here, but I don't oh, think yeah. so, because no, I mean, straight up the inside goes Rene Rast. I mean, that was that was after you, after you, Rene. He was not going to impede the, the uh, progress of Rene Rast, and uh, whether that's team assist or whether he just has got enough performance left in the car, but clearly you could see in turn one, Rene Rast was just taking lumps out of the, the gap between the two cars. It won't be team assist because they're in different teams to an extent, but uh, it will uh, potentially be just the thought that they're in the Pro-Am class. Yes, and, and therefore... And it doesn't yeah. matter where they and finish. It's important, more important for Rennie Rast to get more points. Latif is in a strong position in his particular class, so he's not really fighting that particular Audi. But he's fighting the, his teammate Audi, which is quite interesting. If there was going to be team orders, it would be between these two. There well, we go. He figures it out at the yeah, end. Yeah, I mean, I think he's either he's got an issue on the car or he may have just run out of gas himself, you never know. It's a physical racetrack, it's a lot of concentration. It's warm, even though there is that strong wind blowing down, it's a, it's a, it is a tough circuit to drive. Eight and a half minutes left here in Algarve. And Rene Rast is now up into sixth position then. Seventh for Marcus Vigelhock. Eighth place is Alessandro Latif. Uh, with Zanardi closing in on him as well, potentially. What was the last lap from Zanardi? A 47-0, so really closing in too much. The man to watch out for might be Steph Dusseldorf. He's lapping pretty quickly. And closing in on Chris van der Drift and Giorgio Pantana, the two Bitec McLarens in front of him in 10th and 11th position. So that's one to keep a, a, a wide eye on as across the line they come. There is Zanardi cresting the hill in that Royal BMW. Maybe he can find his way up into eighth place before the end of this race. Down into turn number one again where the circuit drops away using the quicker version of the first two corners as opposed to the sort of hairpin and chicane as we go on board with Zanardi then. Yes, down into turn three, takes a conventional apex, doesn't use all the racetrack on the outside because he wants to get his apex correct into turn four, runs the car slightly over the curbing on the outside but within the limits very comfortably, accelerates down then hard on the brakes down into the major overtaking part of this racetrack, turn five wide on the entry, relatively wide on the exit, and you can still use the bit of green paint and concrete, then through the curve of six, not really a corner, then tricky into turn seven. That maneuver by Artelli around the outside of Zanardi is pretty impressive indeed. And then into turn eight, where the golf camber climbing skywards, and then you drop down this roller coaster, downhill, much steeper than it seems on camera, turn nine, flat out, then you're looking skyward, where's my apex, where are my reference points? Well, there aren't really very many, it's just really by lap you get familiar with where you need to be on the racetrack. Again, drop downhill into turn 12, then the same issue, climbing uphill, looking skyward for turn 13. Another place you can pass, but somewhere that we don't see many overtakes taking place. 14 is really just follow my leader, off camber again, 
long corner, it's almost like a double apex corner. Then the short sprint straight between the exit of 14 into this wonderful, again, turn five. The car gets light on the apex, floats out to the outside. The BMW with the downforce it's got doesn't use so much on the outside of the track as others we've seen. And for Alex Zanardi, if he had another 50 or so horsepower, he would be very happy indeed. Laurence Van Thor in third place is closing in very quickly on the second place car of your own bleak mode. And that last lap he took eight tenths of a second out of him and the gap is just 1.8 seconds between second and third so Bleekermolen and Van Thor is certainly one to keep an eye on there it is Bleekermolen with Van Thor in the number one WRT Audi closing in on him pretty rapidly and they'd be very desperate to get a second place they would like a second place indeed and uh, I think that Jerem Bleekermolen hasn't just backed off he may have an issue maybe the tyre situation doesn't work so favourably for him in the second part of this one hour for our, our championship race and Lawrence Van Thor ever ever a trier I mean some people say he's the quickest guy in an Audi some people say Rene Rast is I think in, in terms of sheer single lap speed Lawrence Van Thor might just edge it but with Rene Rast in an Audi whether it's in a 1 hour 3 hour 6 hour 24 hour race tough guy to beat so we're on board with Lawrence Van Thor defending champion coming through the right hander of turn 14 now let's listen to him into 15 the smallest of lifts it's as a they breathe. came in. It's just, you just breathe, you, you literally yeah. you come off, it's not actually, you, you don't come off the throttle, you just reduce the, the weight of force of your foot on the pedal, and that's just enough to check the car to make sure you're not overly committed, and if it did get sideways as we saw Enger yesterday, well, I mean, it, it sometimes is skill, sometimes it's good fortune that you get the car straightened up again. Just eight tenths of a second between, the bleak amount lost 1.1 seconds on that last lap, so what is going on with that Grasa Lamborghini? Because grip, grip, or lack. He was only well. No, I think it, I think it's Van Thor going quick as opposed to Bleekmolen going slow because they're both. Uh, well, Bleekmolen is lapping similar to Max Buch out in the lead of the race. Well, in that case, then Lawrence Van Thor is absolutely blinding if he's pulling it just simply pace uh, that he's doing to run down Jerome Blakeman in these closing minutes, four minutes of the race to go, and that's going to be the point. In fact, it's two laps, this lap and two more. Yeah, Van Thor and Rene Rast are the two quickest men on the circuit. They're the only men in the 45s. Everyone else is in the mid to high 46s. So WRT perhaps have really found a way of making these uh, tyres last to the end of the race a little bit better perhaps. Three and a half minutes to go. I, I think what it is, the way the idea is set up, it tends to be a sort of a front-end car. So when tyre goes away, tyre grip goes away, then you, you get a more natural balance coming into the car. And it might just be the, the balance that Lawrence Van Thor has got it's simply a, an easier balance and a more competitive balance than we're seeing from uh, Jerome Blekemann. So through the right-hander, how hard is Blekemann going to fight for this second position? That's going to be very interesting. How hard will he be able to fight because of uh, the lack of grip that he's got? But if he loses down to third place, that's another three points that he will lose out on in the championship fight, which would take the gap up to 26 points with two rounds to go. So three minutes left. Now they're onto the penultimate lap of the race here in Algarve. On board with Lawrence Van Thor as he chases down your own Bleekemolen for second position. He's been reeling him in for the past, well, for the whole of the second stint, really. And now he's up behind the back of the Lamborghini. It's still Max Buch leading the way in the HTP Mercedes. So, right, I can't get any closer. And he's going to look and think, have I got a chance? If I'm going to do something, I'm going to have to be maybe either committed or brave or both. And that's going to be done into turn five. Runs very wide. Again, you know, is that gaining him an opportunity to come off the corner slightly quicker? He's going to look down the inside. Look at Mullen. Oh, he's going very late in the day is Laurence Van Thor. Bleekemolen was out of shape on the brakes, but Van Thor gets the job done and he's up into second place. The Grasser team dropped a third. If I was part of the Grasser team, I would say he gained an advantage getting all four wheels off the racetrack. Did he disrespect the corner and gain a benefit and therefore give himself the opportunity to launch himself down the inside? Question, luckily enough, we don't have to answer. So on board we go with your own Bleekemolen who's just dropped down to third position with Two minutes to go here at Gov. 12.5 seconds is still the advantage for Maxi Buch up at the front in the lead of the race in the HTP Mercedes. As they now climb the hill up towards turn 13 and then into 14. Bleak Molen surely won't be able to stick with them. Stick with Van Thor in front because of the pace that we've seen across the line to start the final lap 
comes our race leader Maximilian Buch in the 84 Mercedes. It's been a commanding performance from the Mercedes squad. It was mainly that first stint from Maximilian Gertz, which was absolutely outstanding. And it looks like they're going to win the championship race for only the second time this season. They won the main race in Nagaro in the opening weekend. They haven't been on the top step of the podium since then. What a time to get it, to extend their advantage to 26 points with only two rounds remaining. Down towards the hairpin of five they come. So the gap at the moment is 16 points in the championship, but they will get 10 more points for winning the race. So Max Goetz will end up with 26 points ahead of Harry Prochik and your own Bleak Molen. Bleak Molen was still reasonably close to Van Thor, but not quite close enough to get through. Now this is the perhaps contentious moment we were talking about earlier with John, is that Lawrence Van Thor here takes so much speed through the left-hander, goes all four wheels over, whereas the Lamborghini was pretty much on the track and using that momentum got up the inside into turn number five. Might be something the stewards have a look at. But through the penultimate corner now is about to come Maximilian Buch. He and Max Goetz had a great start to the season in Nagaro and they have led the championship almost non-stop since then as they come out of the final corner now Maximilian Buch and Max Goetz are going to take the main race victory here in Algarve they're going to extend their championship lead as the Mercedes wins in Portugal the chequered flag falls Max Goetz and Max Buch win yeah! delight for Max Goetz on the pit wall punching his fist as Max Buch takes victory second place is going to be Laurence Van Thor across the line Third place then for your own Bleekemolen. So a 26 point margin now at the top of the championship with still plenty left on the table. Out of the final corner comes this battle for fourth place which Stefan Ortelli has just held on to ahead of Thomas Enger in fifth position. It's going to be sixth place for Rene Rass. Seventh place across the line is going to be Marcus Fingelhock. Here's our Pro-Am winner, Alessandro Latif. He's going to come through in eighth position with uh, Zanardi in ninth. And Giorgio Pantano completing the top 10 for the Vitek squad. Uh, Steph Dusseldorf got past Chris van der Drift on that final lap. And here's Dominic Bauman, he and Thomas Jaeger having to pit early on, and they can only finish in 13th position. Stefano Colombo and David Fuminelli are going to win the Silver Cup. Here they come across the line. There's Silver Cup victory for them despite finishing in 15th place but we had two Silver Cup cars eliminated on the second lap of the race. Armand Ibrahim coming together with Vincent Abril. Lucas Stoltz and Lucas Wolf were ending up in the gravel trap for a while. So Stefano Colombo and David Fuminelli taking Silver Cup victory almost by default. That's not too harsh a thing to say. But there's our race winner, Maximilian Buch making his way around to the pits and that means that Max Goetz's advantage at the top of the championship goes up to 26 points. Really strong performance from Max Goetz, you have to say. Commanding, built up a 13 second advantage by the time they got to the round of pit stops 25 minutes into the race. Maxi Boot got in the car and I mean the job was done really. In that first stint he just had to bring it home which he did magnificently as he makes his way back to the pit lane here and our next race weekend is going to be in Zolda in October as we take to the Belgian circuit on the weekend of the 18th and 19th of October so just over a month away there's your own Bleekemolen clearly frustrated with a third place finish and it'll be interesting to hear from John uh, well from your own but when he's with John why exactly that was why he felt the pace got away from him but as I say it was more the pace of Van Thor in the WRT Audi because he was quicker than anyone else it wasn't a bleak moment dropping off as you hear him pull into the pit lane milking all the plaudits out on the slowing down lap Maximilian Buch Two German drivers are going to be on the top step of the podium and for only the second time this season 
Uh, no third time this season, we'll hear the German national anthem. And, and uh, frustration for your own bleak moment. And he is very angry about the excessive use of track limits by the sounds of it. Apologies if you if any of that uh, came through to you. But uh, Bleak Moment very frustrated and very irate. But out of the car climbs Maximilian Buch. He and Max Gertz take victory. And we'll be hearing from them no doubt in a few moments time after being victorious in the main race here at Algarve. A little bit of a chat between them. And as Max Book takes off his helmet, we'll probably start with Maximilian Goats with John Watson. Max, Max Goats, great opening stint for you, got the lead, and from there on really looked very easy. Yeah, it wasn't easy <laughs> how it looks, you know, and uh, the goal was to overtake Harry as soon as possible. We had new tyres in the beginning of the race, so we have to take the advantage. And uh, yeah, then uh, luckily I overtake him, overtook him uh, just before safety car. And after safety car I was uh, driving away because I could, could use the tyres uh, really good. And then, uh, yeah, this was the key uh, in the end. You also made an early pit stop. Was there a reason for that or was it just getting track position? No, we tried to give Max the possibility to get used to it as soon as possible because we know that uh, Jerome was driving with new tyres in this uh, in this time. And yeah, in the end it was, was the, the right decision because uh, I was on the edge with my tyres all the time. Uh, the, the pressure raised up a lot and then yeah in the end we, we managed quite well because the gap in the end was the same like the before pit stop well max book great drive yeah got an advantage when you were after the pit stops washed through there was about a 12 13 second advantage and all you had to do was just run at the pace of the lamborghini yeah very good job from maxi from his side it was just a pleasure to all the weekend long to drive with him and with this kind of good car we had and um, thanks to the team also with this kind of car you are having so much joy to drive and um, for me it was just bringing it home and you know to manage the gap and everything was fine. Well well done you two, you made it look awfully easy this Sunday afternoon, congratulations. Thank you. So victory for Max Poop and Max Goats as they pose for photographs and there is your own Bleak Manor and Harry Prochek getting interviewed for German television. After their third place finish, it'll be very interesting to see what the Euro Bleak Manor has to say because it was absolutely irate as he climbed out of the car. A third place finish means they lose ground to Max Goats at the top of their championship. Let's hear from the second place finishers though, Laurence Van Thor, he's with John. Laurence, you got second place in the end, but maybe controversially. How do you mean controversially? I think your third place car is very unhappy about over exceeding track limits. I think if you lose a game, you're always unhappy. Uh, I respect tra track limits the whole time. Uh, and whether you look on television, other cars who exceed track limits by uh, car length, uh, I think you should rather be talking about that than uh, me. I, I was behind him the first time. I had uh, lost the downforce at a small oversteer, and I went off throttle, and I still went wide. I, can, uh, I didn't get anything with it. We can look on the data, all the laps we did. Uh, so that's not. I would have still overtaken them there if I, even if I didn't arrive with the speed. So uh, that's not not the issue. Excellent, well done. Short to the point with Laurence Van Thorp, and uh, interesting to hear his side of that story. But we'll probably hear another side in a few moments' time with your own Bleak Ronan and Harry Project. They won the qualifying race yesterday. Started on pole position held the lead but project was passed in the early stages by maximilian goats and we can now hear from them there with john jerome break i've never seen you so angry before yeah i mean i hate racing at these tracks because it's all about track limits and we've been talking about it the whole weekend you can go out with four wheels they gave warnings they called people in in practice and then when it really matters in the end of the main race for the points and the prize money um, yeah lawrence you know he just run right twice in a row and i can see it from the car so i think the race director should be able to see it as well and then he has a great run on the straight and get me into the next corner he did a great move and he's a great driver so nothing to that but it's not a fair way to overtake i was always clean always every single lap always with four wheels 
wheels or two wheels in. So I don't think it's fair. And, and yeah, if they don't reverse it, I don't think. Uh, well, maybe he needs a glasses or something. Well, I mean, I've I've looked at it. I commented on it. I know that he was four wheels off the track on the exit of turn four. But Lawrence Van Thor maintains he was still quicker than you, and he would have made the pass anyway. Yeah, but it's easy to say. I mean, the rules are the rules. You can go outside, and if you uh, gain an advantage, it's very clear you should give it back. And he gained at least three or four tenths because you can just go flat out, take it all the way, and he loses arrow when he's behind me. So he's going to run wide if he carries the same speed. But it's racing, you know. That's part of racing. So I'm really, you know, upset if they don't if they don't do anything about it. The rules are the rules, and we have to play by them. And I did it the whole race, the whole weekend actually. I never went out with four wheels or with two wheels. So. I don't know. If they don't do it, uh, I hope uh, yeah, you know, they can look into it at least. Well, anyway, a great drive nonetheless. Harry, you had a good start, but you couldn't keep the Mercedes behind you once that safety car had gone in. Yeah, the, the main problem was that he has new tires and I have used ones and he was so much faster. And I think uh, the last three, four races where I was always behind me, it was always fear. But in that case, it was so... I see he was so much faster that I think a normal race driver after three, four laps gets so angry that it makes no sense when I, when I, I block him or what is possible. So uh, this was okay. But uh, the, what the Chiron also say, uh, the whole weekend we always keep uh, in the lines, uh, in the free practice, he make uh, extra sessions for the drivers and so on. And then you see that the car, what is a, it was a bit, he was a bit faster, uh, Fandor for sure. But uh, the last one, two laps, Mr. Blackamon, Normally, nobody overtakes him under normal uh, conditions. Thank you very much, and no swearing either. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, top job from uh, your own Bleak Man and Harry Project, despite their uh, frustrations, managing to keep their language in check today. So, Harry Project and your own Bleak Man, yeah, the third place finish, but very strong stuff from your own Bleak Man, and very yeah. precise as well. Here's a look at the results after 33 laps. Maximilian Buch and Maximilian Goetz taking victory and extending their championship advantage. Second place for Cesar Ramos and Laurence Van Thor. Within third spot, Harry Prochik and Jerome Bleekermolen. Fabian Hamprecht and Stefan Otelli came from uh, 17th on the grid to finish up in fourth position. Roman Rusinov and Thomas Enger in fifth spot, a solid race from them. And also Rene Rast doing a great job to climb back up into sixth position after Enzo Ede had, we think, made contact with that uh, number one Audi in the early stages. And then Marc Basseng and Alessandro Latif winning Pro-Am. BMWs all in a row from 13th down to 16th position. Thomas Jaeger and Dominic Bauman there in 13th after their issues with a spin early on and collision with their teammates Lucas Wolf uh, and Lucas Stoltz could only finish 17th and it was that 15th place car of David Fuminelli and Stefano Colombo who were victorious in the Silver Cup. Amadi from the Miguel Toril uh, coming together with Vincent Abril in the opening laps and they were forced out of the race. And so Victory for Max Buch and Max Goetz here in the Algarve. They'll soon be taking to the podium. There's Stefan Rattel, the boss of SRO, the championship organizers and promoters. Onto the top step of the podium come Maximilian Buch and Max Goetz. Victory for the two Germans in Portimao. Second place for Laurence Van Thor and Cesar Ramos. And third place for your own Bleekermolen and Harry Prochik in the Grasser Racing Lamborghini. As they go onto the top step of the podium. And it's time for the national anthem. So the German national anthem for the HTP Motorsport squad. Renault Dufour up there on the podium as well, representing the HTP team there on the, the right-hand side. It's the third place trophies awarded to Harry Prochik and your own Bleekermolen. John, you've just come back from the uh, interrogation that it turned into.
the Audi was four wheels off the racetrack, and that's the point that Blake and Mullen has been making. They stay within the white lines. Other drivers are not doing so. They're not saying they're abusing them, they're just saying they're not doing it. Consequently, they can gain an advantage. But on contemporary circuits that we race on, unless you want to, unless you want to put up your razor wire or something on the racetrack, apparently actually just learned from the, from the race stewards that it is an incident that is being investigated. So onto the top step of the podium, Maximilian Boot and Maximilian Goats. They take victory here in the Algarve and the prize money that comes with it. And they now have a strong championship advantage as we head towards the next race in Zolder. And uh, as you say, the incident is now under investigation between Laurence Van Thor and Harry Prochick. But the, the, well, the champagne is sprayed. It's victory whatever for Max Boot and Max Goats. But of course... It's difficult to just penalise this event because it was high profile and we saw it on the telly. Well, there are rules and regulations and Formula One, GT racing, touring cars around the world have got to adhere to these regulations and it applies here as much as anywhere else this weekend. Hugs on the podium then for Book, Goats and Renault Dufort after they take victory in a frantic race here in Algarve. So let's have a look back at it. Harry Prochick took the lead of the race and in second place was Maximilian Goetz as he tried to wrestle the lead away. Prochik did his best to fend them off. It all got a bit busy in the middle of the pack, but soon Harry Prochik was under some extreme pressure. Everyone was safely through the first couple of laps, although uh, Thomas Jaeger managed to pick up a puncture. He had to come into the pit, still re recovered to finish in 13th place. But here was the battle. Prochik doing well to hang on, but in the end, Maximilian Goetz, with his fresh tyres, was able to get through. Yeah, I mean, it was a clean pass down the inside. Harry Prochik did everything correctly, I and mean, he's been saying so all through the post interviews. Here was the big controversial collision, and it was a deem that Sergei Athanathi had just shut the door on the sister Mercedes-Benz and uh, that was the penalty he had to observe, a drive-through penalty. There were great scraps throughout the field. Vincent Abril and Amman Ibrahim had already come together to bring out the safety car and then uh, Roman Rusinov went wide at the first corner. He lost out to Mark Basseng, he lost out to Kaka Bueno and he lost out to one of the WRT Audis as well. And then Bueno lost a lot of time in the pit stops. The battles continued. Zanardi and Ortelli side by side was a joy to watch. Thomas Enger would eventually join in their fun in the orange G-Drive Lamborghini. But Ortelli forced his way past Zanardi and took the place. And then a carbon copy manoeuvre next time around pretty much for Thomas Enger. And Zanardi kept getting shuffled down the field there at the hairpin as the BMW struggled. And he'd done well in fact to get it so high up the order on a circuit that didn't really suit it. Stefan Ortelli took fourth place away from Alessandro Latif who also dropped back to finish in eighth place, but he continued on to win the Pro-Am class. And that was the big moment towards the end of the race. Laurence Van Thor running wide, your own Bleekermolen was furious. And so it'll be very interesting. That incident is under investigation. But Max Book and Max Goats are victorious here in Algarve. The next round is in Zolder. We'll see you then. So for those of you still with us, this is the uh, Silver Cup podium and it's victory for David Fuminelli and Stefano Colombo rather by default in the end because they finished down in 15th place having to make two pit stops because they picked up a puncture as well in the early stages and Lucas Stoltz and Lucas Wolf still come away with a decent amount of prize money despite having to spend a lap in the gravel trap. Yes, and uh, that damage to the car, well, we didn't think there was very much damage but certainly the damage was caused once the impact had occurred and stuck in the gravel trap trying to get out. Uh, is your penalty and uh, that, that was, uh, was proven to be not the fault of the Luca Wolf car. Um, probably it's a bittersweet result. And now we move on to the Pro-Am category. Marc Basseng and Alessandro Latif once again on the top step. An eighth place finish for them. They finished seventh last time out in Slovakia, but uh, they win the Pro-Am class. And second in the Pro-Am class on their Blancpain debut, Francisco Mora and Paolo Pinheiro. And third for Stefan Landman and Sasha Halleck in the Pro-Am categories. Basseng doing a good job in the early stages to have that car running as high as fourth. Well, it was as high as the lead of the race uh, during the pit stop period, as we now hear the German national anthem for Phoenix Racing.
So victory in the Pro-Am class for Alessandro Latif and Mark Basseng, the top step of the podium in Pro-Am once again for them. And Latif is having a good start to his GT career. This is his first proper season. He's joined Phoenix to learn from the very experienced Mark Basseng, a winner of the Nürburgring 24 Hours, a winner of the GT1 World Championship previously. And Basseng actually is one GT racer who didn't start his career in single seat as he went straight into tin tops in uh, St. Leons, I think it was, in Germany. And a handshake with Stefan Rattel as they receive €10,000 for winning the Pro-Am class, which is uh, always a positive as they hold it aloft. And their second place, Francisco Moro and Paolo Pinheiro, started in 21st place, finished the race in 18th position. And the champagne is handed out there on the podium. And uh, it'll be a very pleasing afternoon's work for Alessandro Latif and Mark Basseng really making the Pro-Am category their own as they start to spray the champagne up there on the podium in the Pro-Am class here in the Block Pan Sprint Series. As we say, the next race will be in Zolder in the middle of October. Make sure you join us for that because, again, Zolder is one that always produces some excellent racing at a, at, at a good old-fashioned race circuit. We certainly won't be having track limits discussions at Zolder. That's funny. When you go to an old-school circuit, suddenly everybody respects the white lines. I wonder why. Is it because there might be a barrier just two feet from your door? I suspect it is. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us this weekend here in the Algarve from John Watson and myself, Jack Nichols. Make sure you join us in the middle of October for the sixth round of the championship in Zolder.